problems are always related uh, to, uh, to the virtual uh, tools. But we hope, really hope, uh, that everybody will be able to uh, connect and profit of these days uh, of discussions and exchanges. As you know, in the, the International Intergovernmental Hydrological Program of UNESCO, the groundwater resources uh, is an important part uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the program. And uh, it, in UNESCO, we are giving a particular uh, emphasis uh, of uh, training and, and education so related to hydrogeology, groundwater resources management and governance. It is then with a great pleasure that I want to thank uh, um, the International uh, Resort, the International Center IGRAC, the Swiss Development Cooperation Agency for supporting uh, the GRETA project and, and the related activities. And in particular, to, um, to thank also the colleagues of AMCOV, uh, who are uh, uh, the, main, uh, the main partners uh, of uh, most of the UNESCO uh, education and training uh, uh, programs, activities uh, related uh, to um, the African continent. Uh, AMCOV, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, definitely the most important actor in, uh, in the region, and uh, we are delighted uh, to work hands in hands with them. The course objectives will be explained, I think, by uh, IGRAC colleagues, so I don't want to go into the details. What I wanted to say is that uh, we are fully committed uh, to improve uh, knowledge on groundwater resources. Um, at the end of uh, this year, we are uh, organizing an international conference on transboundary aquifers virtually. Um, it's, uh, of course, open to everybody who wants uh, to assist. It will be uh, almost four days uh, of presentation and discussions. And this will be the, the opening of uh, uh, the year 2022 that will be fully devoted uh, to groundwater resources. I suppose Neno will let uh, you know a little bit more about uh, next year. I thank you very much again, and I hope you will enjoy the course, and I hope the course will be useful for, for most of you. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, thank you very much for this, those in inspiring words. Um, Nino, would you also like to say something? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Arno, and uh, thank you uh, indeed, uh, Alice, because uh, Without uh, uh, UNESCO, we wouldn't be able to uh, be here. Uh, I would like actually to, to say a few words uh, about uh, 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 integrated water resources management and the uh, importance of uh, this relation between groundwater and surface water. Because uh, 30 years ago, uh, I was following a new course uh, given by a gentleman called Philippe Savanet, and uh, the course was on integrated water resources management. And it was a new course, uh, and, and he was uh, uh, founded, uh, he founded that course actually, um, set up. And uh, uh, Philippe Savanet became uh, president of uh, International Association of Hydrologic uh, Sciences later on. And uh, when he uh, completed his uh, discourse on uh, this new um, uh, uh, way of dealing with, uh, with water, integrated way, uh, I asked him, ah, it looks great, but where is groundwater there? And uh, uh, that was for the first time that I realized that actually, actually there is different in, in perception. Uh, and that difference is because uh, of our different education and different experience and uh, many other differences between surface water and groundwater, which need to be uh, discussed and, uh, and overcome. Then 10 years ago, uh, there was, I attended uh, a meeting of 
African-based organization in Bangkok, which is very curious. And uh, I uh, got the opportunity to present uh, on, on groundwater. And again, it was surprised. Uh, my colleagues were surprised by my presentation especially some aspects of groundwater like uh, transboundaries. And I found yesterday a uh, declaration from this bank of meeting, declaration of African basin organizations, where they're saying that they are highlighting the importance of shared aquifer and ground recharge for climate change adaptation, especially in transboundary context. And there is a need to integrate groundwater in water resources management uh, as an adaptation measure for climate change effects. This was already 10 years ago. So uh, the problem, the, the challenge is not new. After that, when I came back, uh, we joined forces with CapNet and uh, BGR, who was uh, busy in, in Central and Western Africa, and put together the first version of training material on integrated groundwater uh, management uh, into transboundary uh, basin organizations in Africa. Uh, later on, uh, the other colleagues joined and there were a couple of trainings. I think that first uh, in the organized training in South Africa, and then naturally that uh, came uh, at uh, African Groundwater Network. And, uh, some of the colleagues uh, are today here. And uh, this network organized uh, several trainings in the last, uh, last year. The last one was uh, in Nairobi, together with our uh, UNESCO colleagues, of course. Uh, I think that was the beginning of uh, uh, Calisto there of uh, 2011. And uh, it was for the uh, other region, for North Africa, and it, it was very good. So I just wanted to give you a little bit this perspective, uh, not only, uh, luckily, I'm not the only one with the memory here, uh, there, there are a couple of uh, good colleagues uh, who can also recall uh, most of these things. But what I wanted to stress there is that uh, uh, conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater uh, and integration of groundwater in uh, river basin management remains a challenge because of differences in regime, and differences in monitoring, assessment, uh, uh, modeling. But we need uh, this conjunction uh, management and we need to learn from each other. And that's the reason that we are uh, together today in the coming two days. So, Finally, you have today excellent lectures, the best mix of experience, the best in Africa, and new fresh insights. So I wish you a very successful course. Thank you. Thank you, Nino, and thank you for the, the background information and, and some history. Um, I prepared a few slides to introduce the, the agenda of, uh, of this course. Um, so let me uh, share it. Um, so like, like you said, you know, uh, the integration of, uh, of groundwater management in uh, transboundary basin organizations in Africa is not a, a new topic. Uh, and in fact, a few years ago, we, we put together uh, a training manual on the integration of groundwater management into ABOs in, in Africa. Uh, together with several other, other partners. Um, and that uh, training manual is available in French and English for free online. You have uh, the address here where to download the, uh, the training manual. Um, and it contains several uh, modules addressing different uh, thematics, different topics uh, related to, to groundwater management for uh, Africa River Basin uh, Organization. And the reason why it is so relevant to integrate groundwater uh, into river basin organizations while it's well described, well written in the introduction. Uh, I mean, groundwater is a, is a major source of, uh, of water in Africa. 
much of it is transboundary, so is uh, surface water. So, and in logic of integrated water resource management, it's really uh, uh, relevant to that we integrate uh, the management of both uh, water resources. Um, so, the, the, the course that we are giving uh, today, tomorrow, and on Thursday is inspired by this uh, training manual, but we've made uh, significant uh, changes. Uh, to include the latest uh, developments in uh, groundwater-related activities in, in Africa and in uh, river basin organizations uh, in particular. And we also wanted to give um, very practical guidance on how to implement that into, uh, in, in LBOs. How do we actually achieve that integration of, of groundwater assessment and groundwater management? So we will have some, uh, some very practical uh, sessions uh, on that. So here is the, the agenda. Uh, today we'll start with a presentation from Professor uh, Moshu Tijani from AMCO, and he will inform us on the latest and the ongoing activities related to groundwater at AMCO. Uh, we know there is uh, a synergy between AMCO and, and AMBO. Uh, so we, we want to, uh, to know what's going on at, uh, at AMCO level. Then uh, we'll have a presentation uh, from Dr. Kalis Tindi Mugaya from Uganda. Uh, on the need for groundwater management in African uh, river basin, lake and river basin organizations. Um, then a presentation from uh, Dr. Mustafa Diene from Sheikh Anta Diop University in, uh, in Senegal on the groundwater challenges like food security, climate change, and environment, and how those uh, challenges related to, to groundwater. Then we'll split for uh, 30 minutes, we'll have a, a break, and we'll resume with uh, a presentation on groundwater quality from Professor uh, Seifugu Mesa from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in, uh, in South Africa, and a presentation from my colleague, Christina Fraser, on uh, transboundary aquifers. Uh, and there will be some time at the end of, the, of this morning for uh, questions and answers. Then tomorrow we'll talk on, um, on groundwater assessment, which is a prerequisite for uh, groundwater management. Uh, and we'll see how, um, how to implement, uh, how to, uh, to carry on the groundwater assessment in river basin organization. And we consider uh, river basin organizations need two things. Uh, they need human capacity and expertise, and they need data. So we'll see how they can achieve that. Uh, and uh, we'll, have, we'll start also with some, some case studies. Um, on uh, tomorrow at the end of the morning, but also on Thursday morning. Uh, first thing, we'll have uh, several presentations from river basin organizations because, I mean, we are aware of what's going on, uh, but we don't know everything. And, um, and we thought it would be a great opportunity for river basin organizations to, uh, to showcase, to show to the others what they are doing, uh, what they have accomplished, and what are the, the challenges ahead so they can share uh, the lessons with, uh, with the, the, the colleagues. Um, by the way, we have uh, invited already a few uh, river basin organizations to make a, a short presentation. Uh, but if you have something interesting, you think interesting to share with the others, you can also prepare a short presentation and we'll be happy to give you the floor uh, for a few minutes uh, so you can talk to, uh, to us and to the others. Um, and then uh, to finish the course, we'll have short presentations from uh, uh, Dr. Tindi Mugaya again on uh, groundwater regulations and from myself on stakeholder engagement. Um, so this is uh, the agenda. Uh, now just briefly some, some practical information, some house rules for this, for this course. Um, there is live interpretation. Uh, uh, so you click, you, you only need to click on the interpretation button at the bottom of, uh, of the Zoom window, and you can have the tr translation from French to English or from English uh, to French. Um, I didn't mention it here, but just so you know, um, the, the course is recorded uh, in French and in English. Um, we kindly ask you to keep your microphone muted uh, unless you are talking. Uh, and in order to talk, you will be invited uh, to, to talk. So please don't uh, keep yourself always muted unless you are in, being invited to, to talk. 
uh, there will be um, uh, dedicated sessions for questions and answers where you can interact with the speakers or with the, the other participants. Uh, if you want to say something, if you want to speak, just raise your hand. There is uh, a logo, a button, uh, it's on the right panel where you can raise your hands and ask to, to talk and then you'll be invited to, to talk. Uh, and once you have talked, of course, uh, and raise your hand. Uh, Otherwise, you can always use the chat anytime uh, to, um, uh, to ask your questions and we'll take note of your question. Or if you want to say something, uh, you can always uh, use the chat. Um, because we have many participants today, we won't have uh, an introduction round, but uh, there too, I invite you to use the chat uh, to greet the others and to introduce yourself. Um, so that's it with that. Uh, and now I will invite uh, Professor Moshu Tijani uh, to let us know uh, what's going on at, uh, at AMCO. Thank you. Is it okay, uh, Moshud, to share your, your presentation? I cannot hear you and I cannot see you. Moshud, are you with us? Well, he was a moment ago, uh, it's probably connection with the... Uh, okay. Um, yeah, then I suggest we we move to the next presentation and then we'll go back to, to Moshut uh, later on, because I don't know how long it will take for him to, to go back to the, to the course. Um, so who was next uh, on the agenda? Uh, and that will be the turn of, uh, of Calist, uh, Dr. Tindi Mugaya, to make a presentation on the need for groundwater management in African lake and river basin organizations. Oh, I see that Moshud is back. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Calist. Uh, Moshud, you are muted. We cannot hear you. Moshud, we cannot hear you. Oh, sometimes it's uh, sorry. Yeah, are you okay. hearing me now? Yes. Okay. Is the slides okay? Can can one see the slides? No, not yet. Oh. So there is a let green button. Share. share screen. Uh, let me see, share it again. I, I've shared it initially, and then something went wrong, and then the. Yeah, you disappeared for. Uh, for yes, the, the network disappeared, and then I have to log in again. So, sorry, let me quickly share the screen again. Yeah, I hope she should be feasible now. Yes, you can make it full screen maybe. Yeah, Slide I'm show. trying to do that. Okay, I think yes, because please. of the network, I might, I might likely switch off my video so that I will use only audio so I to enhance the signal so i'm sorry for that I have to... sure. yeah first of all i have to thank igrac and my unesco for this opportunity and for this wonderful initiative of uh, of this uh, uh, training course and uh, it's a wonderful team, and uh, we have to appreciate the contribution of UNESCO and NEGRAT in this respect in supporting African groundwater community. So my job this morning is just to give a kind of overview of the groundwater activities at AMCO. And uh, I'm going to do that by looking at AMCO Pan-African Groundwater Program, which we call APA Group. And uh, I want to look at it from the perspective it is an agenda 
that we have at AMCO for sustainable groundwater resources management and transboundary aquifer management in Africa. So my name is Tijani Moshud. I'm the groundwater and the climate change lead at AMCO. And then my presentation outline will follow this, uh, this trend. I'll give you a kind of background about AMCO and the upper group itself which is the groundwater program in AMCO. Then I will mention the key activities of groundwater at AMCO. So for example, we talk about our transboundary water management program, our water quality management program, and then we'll look at the AMCO contribution in terms of groundwater education and capacity building. And then we'll then have some summary and concluding thoughts. Of course, I will give a kind of a looking forward in terms of collaboration and partnership. So as a way of introduction, water resources are critical to socioeconomic growth and improvement of both urban and rural livelihood in Africa. And more so, if you look at 10 out of the 17 SDG that we have, 10 of them are clearly directly or indirectly related to clean water and sanitation, which is SDG 6. And also attainment of eight out of the 17 SDGs are also clearly directly or indirectly related to tackling the menace of climate change. So you can see the twin relationship between water resources management and the climate change and how these are sensitive to ensuring water security in Africa. Therefore, the strike for water security become more critical when we look that, when, when we realize that the future pressures for water resources, both at the supply and the hand end, and when particularly also, we know that population, climate, land use changes, all these are drivers, all these are stressors that we exacerbate the problem of water security. So in Africa, the crucial role of water in achieving socioeconomic development is widely recognized. There is no doubt about that. And that is why the African Water Vision 2025 emphasized an Africa where there is an equitable and sustainable use and management of water resources for poverty, alleviation, socioeconomic development, regional cooperation, and environment. It's encompassing. That is what the vision for 2025 is efficient. But however, all along, sanitation and hygiene are historically crave the attention in most cases in form of wash. So therefore, AMCO strategy is a kind of inclusive integrated water management for water security, for food security. However, despite this, the normal surface and groundwater resources in Africa, we know that realizing the water security at present is very challenging due to some factors like population growth, rising, I mean, rising living standard, land use changes, climate changes, urbanization. These are things that are also related to population growth and all these make the challenges of meeting the groundwater, sustainable groundwater resources difficult in Africa. So AMCO mandate vis-a-vis -vis groundwater is what I'm trying to look at here. AMCO, AMCO strategy 2018 to 2030 have been prepared with the overarching goal to strategically position AMCO effectively to deliver on these two commitments. And this commitment are number one, to assure the dignity of the people of Africa by providing adequate, adequate and sustained sanitation services. And to do that, we need water. That is clear. The second point is to support the member state to develop, manage, and utilize water resources to assure, to assure water, food, and energy security in Africa. So we are talking of the nexus of food, energy, and water security. So within this framework, water is the central key. Sanitation, you need water. Food security, you need water. Energy, you need water. And that is why water is very critical in this way. 
and not only water, you also realize the fact that within those commitments, groundwater is going to play a major priority role. And that is why AMCO priority uh, strategic program lay a kind of priority on groundwater for the strategic plan 2018, 2030. And that was why also within the African water security, integrated water resources management, focusing on both surface and groundwater at national and transboundary level is very critical. And that is the target of AMCO to ensure that. AMCO strategy, as I said, is based on four strategic pillars and four cross-cutting priorities as shown in the, and these four strategic pillars and cross-cutting priority is also based on the fact that as AMCO, we have a kind of delivery mechanism on water and sanitation for the specialized technical committee of the African Union. And within this framework, we have 55 ministers from member states of the AU as part of the governing body, 15 members of the executive council of ministers, and we have 25 members of technical advisory committee. Of course, we have the executive secretariat where we have an executive secretary managing the secretariat. Our vision is that we want to ensure Africa where there is an equitable and sustainable use and management of water resources for poverty elevation, as I mentioned. And the mission is to provide the political leadership, policy direction, advocacy in the use and management of water resources for socioeconomic development in Africa. So when you look at this, when you look at this framework and the strategic framework that I mentioned, you realize that at the end of the day, these four overarching pillars are what is the building block of AMCO. Water security, safely managed sanitation, good water governance, AMCO effectiveness. That is the pillars. And then with this, this pillar, we now have cross-cutting priorities. And this cross-cutting priority serve as building block on which these pillars are resting. And that is about gender equity and youth empowerment in water resources management, monitoring, evaluation, and knowledge management. There is no way we are going to manage water resources without monitoring, especially when you relate, when you are looking at groundwater. We need to monitor groundwater in terms of the water level, the quality, and so on. So knowledge management is there. We create knowledge and we manage the knowledge. Sustain finance in the water and sanitation sector is also key. How do we attract infrastructural development in water, groundwater, and sanitation sector? And so on. Of course, the resilience to climate change is another issue. These are the cross-cutting priorities that serve as building block on which the four priority pillars, I mean, strategic pillars uh, uh, lies. So about Anko groundwater program, the Pan-African, uh, the AMCO Pan-African Groundwater Program, which you call APAGO, that is the ad acronym. AMCO, A, P for Pan, then I for Africa, then you have the Groundwater Program. That's the acronym. So what, how do we start? What was the timeline? AMCO convened the first groundwater workshop in October 2019 in Nairobi. And many of the partners that are sitting here are part of the initiators and the conceptualizers of these uh, ideas Ken, in Kenya. We have several experts and representatives for financiers and member countries discuss on the issue around African groundwater development and management. And then it is later in Kampala in 2020, in February, that the upper group is then formalized. So if you look at the cartoon that I have there, you have October 2019 in Nairobi, where the first initiative meeting was taking place, the actualization by February in Kampala, when the operationalization of APA Group by April, Groundwater Dex Officer is fully functioning with the engagement of 
groundwater decks officer by July, September, series of meetings of upper group, working group, and so on, until currently we are moving towards the fact that by March, we have series of action group that have been formalized in 2021, and we are in the process of moving forward by organizing uh, webinars with um, planning groundwater donors conference to enhance the groundwater deck. So this is the timeline of what upper group has been. What is the aim and goal of upper group? The principal aim of upper group is to leverage on science and reassert the influence of groundwater policy and practice in Africa. Many of us know that when we talk of water resources, it's easy to look at streams, river, dams, and so on. So groundwater is always neglected. So the focus of our group is how do we leverage on science? How do you reassert the influence of groundwater policy and practice in Africa? And the goals are to promote sustainable management and utilization of groundwater, promote appropriate technology and practice in groundwater development, and to improve the policy and practice of groundwater in Africa for better life and livelihood. So, so other specific objectives are listed here for the sake of time. I don't think I'm really necessary to go through everything, but one of it is also to demonstrate the benefit of development and thus to make groundwater represented in continental major water strategic program, rather than heated to when surface water, dams, rivers are the ones that are being looked at. We want the focus to also be on groundwater and also to make sure that at the highest political level, groundwater is put in the agenda. So why groundwater then? That will be the question that we first ask ourselves at this point. Globally, there are increasing dependence on groundwater for both national and transboundary aquifer, in most cases for agriculture and domestic water supply. Generally, because of the increasing population, especially in the developing world, agriculture is needed, food is needed, our domestic water supply is needed, and water is the key for those. Then the potentials of groundwater with respect to domestic and irrigation water in part of rural Africa is high, up to 70% contribution in some cases. And also 320 million people in Africa lack access to safe water supply. And if that is so, because of the failing public water supply system, then in most cases, developing groundwater resources is the only realistic way to meet those large demand. In addition, there are increasing dependence of many urban centers. Many urban centers that are heated to rely on public water supply, pipe bond water, because of the failing system in many developing countries especially in sub-Saharan Africa, in Africa, in most cases now, many urban centers now are relying on self-sustained groundwater resources. Of course, in addition, we know that about 75 of African population are dependent on groundwater for basic water supply. So all these make it imperative that the focus need to be on groundwater. And in addition, we now have to look at it. And when we look at it from water security perspective, groundwater provide a kind of inexpensive upgrade distributed water supply to both rural and urban population. In terms of food security, it is also a relatively cheap source of water for smallholder agriculture. You don't need large scale irrigation. Smallholders agriculture with small borehole, they can do irrigation activities. So in terms of food security, groundwater is also there. Safe water supply for, for sanitation is also there because it is protected from normally, generally protected from contamination compared to surface water. So in terms of safe water supply, it is easy in terms of the quality. Then in terms of revealing to climate change, at least in the challenging period of climate change, it has been proven that groundwater has some level of resilience to meet the challenges of climate change. So when you look at all these reasons, definitely the future is on developing groundwater resources, but then developing it sustainably. So then what is the strategy of upper group in developing or in making sure that we have 
Sustainable Groundwater Resources Management in Africa. APA Group is meant to develop program and initiative for improving the policy and practice of groundwater in Africa for better lives and livelihood. And if you look at the diagrams on this page, we have three pillars on which the APA Group is standing. Policy governance and institutional strengthening. Then you have the groundwater management and resource assessment. And then you have the awareness, knowledge management, and capacity development. These are the three pillars. And if you look at the policy, governance, and institutional strengthening, what are we going to do in those areas under APA Group? We develop and strengthen national groundwater policy framework across the member states, increase investment in groundwater and Pan African at Pan African national level, raising the profile of groundwater and related development agenda among member states. These are part of policy initiative that AMCO is trying to influence and develop within the member state to increase the governance of groundwater and groundwater management. In the case of resources assessment, we, if you don't understand the resource you, are, you have, how do you manage? So that is the second pillar where we are talking of resource assessment, developing and strengthening groundwater management at local and national level, increase the uptake tools in improving the assessment, improve technique and adaptive technology to sustainable development and management. How do you develop the water sustain, groundwater sustainably? How do you manage this sustainable? What are the technology that is available? These are areas that we are going to also look at. And in doing this, we will generate knowledge, we will create awareness. And that is the third option. Where we have to raise awareness, generate knowledge, and also develop capacity. Under this is where the training comes in. And the cross-cutting basis is that we cannot do all these three without leveraging on science and technology. And that is why the cross-cutting is the idea that we are going to leverage on science, we have to leverage on technology to be able to achieve this strategic uh, plan of upper group. And this is the operational structures of upper group. This is like organograms. So I won't want to waste time on this for the sake of time. Then. Then what are the expected uh, results or outcome for this uh, benefit, expected benefit to member state of this upper group program? Mapping of groundwater resources for sustainable management of you know, and, and utilization to enhance water security in Africa will be one of the deliverables and achievement that will showcase the benefit to member state there will be need for capacity development of groundwater practitioners to improve sustainable use of groundwater in respective member states. Community of practice will be established. By doing this training, like this type of training that we are doing and all of that kind of training that will be there, we'll be building community of practice and be able to get people who we can call champion that will be making the best practice and knowledge available in terms of groundwater management. Then, of course, we have to encourage how do we deploy, deploy appropriate technology and partnership to drive groundwater practice among member states. And lastly, of course, the awareness and knowledge sharing and the policy initiative to influence the government in investing in groundwater resources management. So what are the key activities now of groundwater that we want to look at? Looking at that, we have several activities that I want to showcase this morning briefly. So the policy and governance system, we have some policy recommendation and institutional capacity strengthening. In terms of knowledge sharing and coordination, knowledge creation, knowledge sharing activity, we have it at AMCO Secretariat, which is to disseminate knowledge and information and knowledge sharing among member states. In terms of groundwater resources assessment, we have a number of groundwater programs like the Part 1, Power Work, and so on, which are programs that relate to water management and assessment. 
Of course, the awareness and capacity development in terms of training, education, and so on. These are the activities that are related to thematic areas of fair. Now, first of all, let's look at the transboundary aquifer, the management of transboundary water in Africa. What is the contribution of AMCO to this? Fact and figure first that we need to know. About 72 transboundary aquifers have been mapped in Africa, and this underlies 40% of the continent. You can see 40% of the continent have transboundary aquifer. We are 33%, about 381 million population lives. So you can see the cross cutting of these boundaries uh, of the aquifer across the boundary. And the need should, for should I'm, I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but uh, your slides are not moving along with your. Uh... With your presentation, we're still on the expected benefits to the member states. Oh, I think I, I witnessed it that there is a slow. Is it moving now? Because it's moving at my hand now. I don't know. No. What, what you could do is uh, stop sharing and then frozen. share again. Okay, I think the, the, the thing has frozen. Mm -hmm. is, so let me stop share and share again. Sorry for that. Yeah, I think it's the network. Yeah, now we see Amco and Lake River Basin organizations. Let me this is the slide that. we see now. Yeah, but it's, it's slow to react to, to changing. Uh, I, I wanted to move a bit uh, backwards so that we... And is, is it the slide you wanted to present? Amco and Lake River Basin organizations? No, no, I, I would just want to move a bit forward. Okay. But it's, it's, but it's moving, like yeah. it's, it's, it's frozen. It's not moving. It's frozen at this end. Too. Let me, I think uh, what we can do, maybe at times the full mode is also a problem. So I don't know. Let's okay. see if it works without the full mode. But it's man can now see your picture. No, we're still on the same slide. In, uh, OK, let me move ahead window. and see. It's not even moving again. No, no. But if even you stop sharing my, and then you minimize. Yeah, too. It's, it's not moving. So let, let me close the file and reopen the file. Okay. Okay. Let me share again. Technology. Okay, factor needs for TB. Okay, uh, is, it, is it clear enough like this? Because I'm thinking if it's going to be okay like this, instead of putting it on the full screen mode. Yeah, I, I, can I, I, it is it is fine by me. I hope for okay. the others too. Okay, let's let's move on. As I said, we have a, a number of large aquifer that are transboundary. About seven of these transboundary have been subjected to more detailed study with cooperation that have been formalized. And about 47 of the 72 mainland African countries, only Syria alone and Equatorial Guinea have any known trans, have no known transboundary aquifer, which means 47 have transboundary aquifer. And that means 
transboundary aquifer management has to be a key thing in Africa if you want to ensure international cooperation in water resources management. You're just trying to see if the slide is moving again. What, what, what we can do, uh, so, someone okay, in yeah. the chat. Yeah, okay. okay. yeah. The, the next slide is about what is the lake, the AMCO and the Lake and River Basin Organization. So uh, Lake and River Basin Organization has I mean, offered great potential for the African development. When you look at the, what they can do in terms of hydropower, agriculture and industrialization. Also, AMCO recognized the fact that lakes and river basin are important building block for effective management of water at the regional and continental level. So therefore, water resources management within the framework of the Mary Water Corporation at river basin. Something amazing level just... can offer to ensure sustainable conjunction and to maintain peace and secure role that um, that sustainable and effective management of rivers basin can deliver to the member states. Then what the Pan-African transboundary water management at AMPO, what we need to achieve with that? What is our objective? Number one is to promote equal participation and mutual trust across the riparian member state, to promote peace and sustainable water resources management, to promote social and economic well-being among the member states, and promote cost-efficient benefit, protecting both public and health and environmental means by improving lives and livelihood of the people within the riparian state. Of course, we also need to address the issue of climate change. By doing it together, by conductive and integrated management at river basin level, definitely the, there will be synergy in, man, in fighting climate change. Then what are the segments of the Pan-African uh, transboundary water management at AMCO? We have on the surface water side and we have the groundwater side. On the surface water side, we want to enhance the institutional capacity of the riparian member state. On the groundwater side, we want to raise the profile of groundwater aquifer management within the framework of water resources management, which it that too many of the river basin have not been focusing on. How do we inclusively focus on raising the groundwater management within the river basin organization? And finally, what are the coordinating circle? We are in the process of rolling out this uh, uh, Pan-African transboundary water management. We want to facilitate the greater understanding and cooperation of the member states. We want to do pilot regional case studies of selected by water I mean, transboundary water organization. And in doing that, there are specific key activities that we need to do. We want to conduct stakeholders' involvement through inception phase, conduct gap analysis and needs assessment, undertake target advocacy for decision maker, which is very key because decision makers need to be carried along. Then development of action plans for transboundary water aquifer management for reservoir basin. So that is very key. Of course, the other aspect that has to do with the coordinating role of AMCO is to develop guidelines and tools and standards by which the member state and the river basin can operate. A unified guidelines, a unified standard. AMCO can use its convening and coordinating power to do those. Now, finally, the focal area, of course, we have to have assessment, strategic plan, networking, coordination. These are part of the strategy to, to do. And let's move to the water quality program the sake of time, of there, course, there's will no, be only water. five minutes left. Uh, oh, we, uh, I will manage the remaining time. So, okay. for the water quality program, we know that uh, water quality is a very critical issue, especially in Africa countries. So, 
many in terms of the quality, we have problem because of the urbanization pollution. We have the natural quality has been threatened also. And then sources of water protection is also not there. An the example of some of these uh, diagrams have shown, you can see the localized contamination by not making sure that the water points are properly managed. Of course, our Pan-African Water Quality Initiative is to, uh, we have a goal to create a strong water quality database and a self-driven water quality pollution control initiative in Africa through the power that is, we call it Pan-African Water Quality Program. We want to promote collective action to ensure protection of water quality and enhance water security in Africa. Also, within the scope, we want to work with NGO, we want to work with partners, and we want to work with uh, collaborators in ensuring that we look at the current and emerging issue as it relates to water quality in the urban and rural environment of Africa. We want to identify key international players in water quality sector and establish appropriate collaboration mechanism. We want to take stock of the ongoing Africa and international initiative so that we can direct and link to water quality and promote north-south learning. Of course, the current activity that we are doing at our water quality initiative is now that we are launching, we launched this week a online water quality survey initiative that we are doing to, to a kind of scoping study. So, so many of you we in the coming days might be receiving those links to participate in the survey so that we want to use those surveys to, 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 to scope what are the capacity, what are the capability to monitor groundwater level, to monitor groundwater quality, to protect groundwater pollution in many countries. The analytical side is there, the technical side of uh, ensuring the prevention of water contamination and pollution is there. What are the existing capacity in different country? What are the needs? And that will inform the next step that we want to do in terms of uh, water quality management in Africa. So of course, the survey cover aspect of human capital, as I said, aspect of laboratory testing capability, water pollutant, key pollutant uh, sources at country level and so on. And then ANCO contribution to ground to groundwater education and capacity building. I think that is exactly this is like the cross of the matter where we are here. And I'll take the next three minutes to quickly run through this to show how capacity building is very key in uh, in uh, groundwater management in Africa. Groundwater education capacity building. These are statistics that we have here, which shows why education groundwater education and capacity is needed. We've mentioned some of these statistics that large population in Africa are, are relying on uh, groundwater. Definitely education and sustainable management of this water and capacity building is very key if you want to ensure the sustainable management of this. Uh, and when you talk of the human capacity development or so on, there are two ways, education, training, all these form of uh, capacity building will generate knowledge, they will generate skill and competence. And when all of them are put together within an enabling environment, within an organizational setting that provide incentives, that will lead to effective service delivery of the professional. Without that, we won't be able to develop the capacity that will, be able, that will manage groundwater resources sustainably in Africa. It is on this note that we at AMCO level, we think that capacity building is very key, but we need institutional policy strengthening. We need human resources development together with the capacity building to deliver the sustainable groundwater resources management. AMCO contribution in this way also lead to the fact that uh, the role of the role out of the upper group is to enhance human capacity is to facilitate exchange of exchange knowledge, as I mentioned. And within this framework, we can see the concept of upper group 
and ample, that we have knowledge management on one side, we have capacity development on one side, and within the capacity development, we have policy and institutional strengthening, human capacity strengthening, and then we are developing groundwater management support tool at African Dev. We have a case study of the, a, a, a case study is going on in uh, Namibia supported by BGR in this respect. And on the knowledge management side, we are, we are creating information, we are creating knowledge, and we'll be sharing this knowledge among member states who we'll involve in gender advocacy, gender inclusion and advocacy. And at the end of the day, we are creating groundwater knowledge of within the African, uh, uh, within the AMPO Secretariat for the benefit of member state. And this is a, the knowledge hub in our Secretariat. We have the library, we have our digitizer where we are all the, so a lot of organizations, IGRAC and so on, they have provided their database to us and we have a kind of hub where we domicile all this knowledge and sharing it with member state. So finally, the key, priority areas in terms of capacity development is how do we ensure curriculum review and train the trainer capacity building? How do we increase investment in infrastructure and adaptable technology? How do we, how do we ensure gender and youth inclusiveness? How do we strengthen the capacity of, of the policy decision maker to be able to be aware of the challenges of groundwater? How do we invest in research and innovation? So how do we also encourage technology-driven, technology that is going to be transformative? So these are key priority areas that actions are needed in terms of the capacity building. And collaborations are needed in terms of this. So, and that is why in the, towards the last slide, we are, I'm talking about the data driven that moving forward, all this information that we are talking about, all this initiative, we need data, we need knowledge. Data will lead to information. Data will lead to knowledge. Data will give us informed decision. And to have this data and informed decision, definitely we need a lot of capacity, technical capacity in terms of training, financial capacity, donor support, institutional support, institutional capacity, governance support, and so on. And that is the essence of this training to ensure all those uh, things. So I'm moving forward. Yeah, we, we need to, to stop. Uh, is so it your last slide? Final, this, is the final, this is the last slide. So moving forward, we need collaborative support. We need policy, stakeholder, groundwater network, institutional support, of course, private the partnership, development partner, NGOs, and so on. And finally, I want to use this opportunity to say that this training workshop of the greater project aim at improving groundwater management and governance at local transboundary level can be regarded as timely, and it is an investment in the right direction, and we appreciate the effort of uh, UNESCO in supporting this. Once again, and thank you for your attention, and I hope I pass the message that we have a lot of things that we're doing at AMCO, and we, we are looking for partnership and collaboration to deliver to member states. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, uh, Moshut. Um, it's already 10 a.m., so according to the agenda, we should move to the next presentation. Uh, but I, I'm not sure whether you will stay with us until the end of the, the morning, so maybe we could collect one or two uh, questions very quickly. Is there a question for uh, Professor Tijani? Please raise your hands uh, in the chat or in the um, yeah, next to you. Uh, Do we have a question? Hello? I, I, I will try and hang around to the end of the, in case there is any question later. Okay, okay, thank so you. Because I don't see any question so for now. Uh, we are guaranteed the hands so that uh, during the question and answer session, I will, I will, I will be on board if there is okay. any question then. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, then it will be time to uh, for next presentation uh, from Dr. Tindi Mugaya. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator, for this uh, opportunity. I want to find out whether you are able to run my presentation or I share it from here. I, I don't know if your connection is good enough. You can share it from your side. Otherwise, you can send it to me and I will display it from my side. It's, uh, I don't know how much you trust your, your, your internet connection. Well, my internet connection may not be good. So that's why I wanted you to do it from there. But all of the same, I think I can try. You already have it. I think I shared with you. OK. Let me. Yeah, you can run it from there so that I'm sure my internet is not good. You already have it, so if you can help me to run it from there, then I would appreciate. Thank you. Uh, give me a second. I cannot find your presentation. Uh, oh, you can't. Okay. Uh, okay, so let. I let don't know if I'm looking it. in the right folder. Yeah, please start, and I, I will try to find the, the presentation just in case. Uh, let me maybe try to run it from here. That might be better. Yes, I think if you could um, try and load it from, from where you are, and then if it doesn't work, we can look for something alternative. Kalist, is it the one you shared a while ago, or did you share an updated version recently? No, let, let, let me try to share from here. Galista, I have a presentation here, but it's uh, the one you share uh, one month ago. Or I just want yes, to be yeah, sure that's the, the right. one. So yes. Okay, then then that's, I will share this one. one. So if you can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Is that? Um, yes. That's that the one, can... thank you very much. Okay, you just need to tell me when you want to move to the next slide. Yes, I, I will do that. So again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I will be taking you through this presentation on the need for groundwater management in transboundary river basin. basins. I work for the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda, and I'm also the steering committee for the Africa Groundwater Network. Next. Yes, uh, when we talk about groundwater, we want to take note of the fact that it is part of the water cycle. This is water that is stored underground. And this is water that has gone underground for many years. 
So when we are managing this groundwater, we need to take note of this, that is part of the water cycle. So whatever happens on the surface, whatever happens with surface water, with the vegetation, with the land surface, has an impact on groundwater, although it is undercover and not seen. Next. Yes, uh, in Africa, groundwater is very, very important. I think many of us know that is a key source for drinking water in urban and rural areas. Many of the towns, many of the big and small towns we have in Africa are depending on groundwater. We are having in many semi-arid areas, uh, we are having groundwater being a source of water for livestock. And we are now taking on groundwater to be a source for small scale irrigation. Again, because climate change impacts are becoming common in many of our areas, we are looking at how we improve food production and groundwater is also being looked at as the source. Of course, many of the people in Africa, over 1 billion people in Africa rely on groundwater for their daily water supplies. Because surface waters are drying up and we're having perennial shortages in surface waters, uh, then people are depending on groundwater because it is available in many of the places. And of course, it is also key in helping us to manage water scarcity, which is now continue, is continuing to increase in many of our countries. And of course, when we talk about river basin management, again, and we start talking about conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater, then groundwater becomes key in this aspect. And what you can see here is a map showing a number of cities that depend on groundwater and the number is increasing. And also the scale of groundwater development also increasing within Africa. Thank you very much. And con let's continue to the next slide. So again, transboundary groundwater aquifers have not been well assessed broadly on the Africa continent. So we continue to identify a number of transboundary aquifers within Africa. But what is clear is that we don't have much information, scientific knowledge and information about these transboundary aquifers. While uh, we know quite a lot about surface water, but when it comes to groundwater, the situation is different. But also, we also note that we have limited cooperation on transboundary aquifers, and we have very few management organizations and legal frameworks. So this is quite a lot that we need to do in this regard. Next. Again, uh, a number of transboundary aquifers have been mapped, and many more continue to be identified over 80 transboundary aquifers covering over 42% of the area of Africa. And of course, covering about 30% of the population. And we're also having 63 international river and lake basins and 21 international basin organizations. So you can see that although we have many aquifers, transboundary aquifers, the work around those aquifers is not as advanced as a river basin or lake basins in Africa. Next. So river basins in Africa, really a lot of work has been done over the years. We have good scientific knowledge on the characteristics of surface waters in may, many of the basins we have in, in, in Africa. And there has been also long-term cooperation on transboundary surface water management. Again, many management organizations exist and legal frameworks exist across Africa. Next. So when you try to put the map of transboundary basin organizations and transboundary aquifers, they don't match. So we know that in many areas, aquifers cut across a number of basin organizations, but also you find that managing transboundary aquifers in a number of areas may not be the same as managing uh, river basin organizations. So this, these maps indicate that <clears throat> although we have a number of transboundary basin organizations and also a transboundary aquifers, they may not necessarily be managed under the same arrangement. Although in some areas, groundwater can easily be managed as part of the river basin organizations. Next. 
So again, uh, we talk about uh, regional distribution of, of fresh groundwater resources. We note that within Africa, we have a substantial amount of water resources and uh, a lot of this water on the continent of Africa is also uh, uh, underground water resources. So again, when we are looking at the resource, fresh water resources, we need to look at surface water and groundwater resources together so that they can meet our needs. Next. Uh, again, groundwater interacts with the surface water in a number of areas. We have a situation where we have streams gaining water from groundwater, but also streams losing water, for, uh, losing water to groundwater. So surface water, groundwater interaction in those cases becomes very, very important. So when we are looking at the groundwater, we need to remember that a number of areas may be connected to surface water. What you do with surface water will have an impact on the groundwater. Next. So how can transboundary aquifers be managed? Next. In a number of areas, we can actually have standalone uh, uh, transboundary aquifer organizations, but in a number of situations, we can integrate groundwater in the basin organizations. Next. So the process we have gone through to try and see how we can support groundwater management in river basin organization, Part of this has already been mentioned as part of the introduction, but a lot of information analysis was done, desk studies and using existing maps. We did a needs assessment for basin organizations. Basically wanted to know why are they not dealing with groundwater and what can be done to deal with groundwater. We had a number of consultative meetings and then we developed a training manual, which is the basis of this training. And we have also had a number of training workshops that have been conducted basically to test the ground and see how we can move this agenda forward. Next. Uh, this uh, assessment of uh, the, how we can integrate groundwater and river basin organizations was done through a survey of nine lake and river basin organizations in Africa and a number of organizations. And as you can see on the screen, we're very much involved in this work. And this work has really been done collaboratively. And I must say that has been very interesting to work with a number of organizations in this regard. Next. So uh, we looked at the nine river basin organizations in Africa. And the key issues we looked at was which level is groundwater dress in the basin organization? We wanted to know are these basin organizations actually addressing groundwater or not? and how can transboundary aquifers be managed. So this survey helped us to understand a, a, a bit about what river basin organizations actually think about groundwater. Next. And these are the basin organizations you looked at, quite a cross section, next. Next. We also have this, a number from Southern Africa, but also we had also the Nubian sandstone aquifer as one of the, areas we assessed. Next. So when we looked at the basin organizations, we did a short analysis and we noted that these basin organizations already have agreements that they are existing. They have permanent secretariats and they can easily bring groundwater high on the agenda because they are already well focused and with high political support. And they, they, they also already have focal points at political and technical level within the riparian states. And we also feel that they can provide a, a suitable platform for hosting transboundary groundwater data and for managing the use of this data. Next. We, of course, noted, looked at the weaknesses. We noted that these basin organizations are advisory. They really don't have the power. They don't have legal mandate to enforce. Many of them are not well integrated in groundwater. Actually, when we were talking to them, many of them were saying they don't know why they are dealing with not dealing with groundwater. They didn't have any capacity and they didn't really know how they can progress. Of course, insufficient understanding of transboundary groundwater issues in basin organization because of their nature and they lacked the data and the staff to be able to deal with the groundwater. And then the skills and personnel were also limited. Next. 
But we also noted opportunities that they can take lead in transparent groundwater management and monitoring. They can help us to establish my sector state task forces. And also we noted that we can use these uh, vessel organization develop protocols on groundwater data sharing. You already have surface water data sharing protocols. And also we feel that we can take advantage of the pool of expertise that is available in the member states. Next. Then of course, the, 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 the threats, the lack of finances and procedures on transboundary groundwater management, technical complexities, and understanding of groundwater and possible conflict of interest, and also lack of knowledge of groundwater resources, and basically the training programs for transboundary groundwater management were not available. And this was one of the reasons why we felt we should develop this training money. Next. So we did quite a number of, had a number of consultative meetings to develop this manual. We also tested the manual in a number of locations as has already been mentioned. And we also realized that we need to create a critical mass of people trained in this area as train, trainers and also the practitioners. Next. So again, there are a number of arguments for including groundwater and integrated water resources management and basin organizations. Again, we have 20 arguments. I run through them very fast. But we have conflict over shared groundwater resources. So these conflicts can be avoided if we integrate groundwater and integrated water resource management and other basin organizations. Costs and resources of monitoring can be shared. We can handle groundwater and surface water together. Benefits of groundwater development can be equitably shared. General collaboration and goodwill can be shared. We already have countries share, uh, collaborating on surface water. So we can take advantage of this impact of groundwater development and use in one member state. State may affect another. Again, very important that the states will want to work together on this. Impacts of groundwater cross borders may not be obvious without joint monitoring. Next. Then uh, develop, developing groundwater in connection with transparent surface water, the conjunctive use and management of groundwater becomes very important that you can relieve pressure on surface water by going in for groundwater, but the management arrangement as part of the water cycle becomes very important. And of course, uh, groundwater may both function to alleviate drought and floods if properly managed and many territorial ecosystems are groundwater dependent and cannot be properly managed without knowledge of groundwater resources. Next. We also note that the groundwater is paramount in preserving significant ecosystems and biodiversity. And again, we know that groundwater cannot be considered as a single and unlimited resource. We need to look at it broadly as part of the overall water resource. An integrated approach creates better understanding of water flows and water balances within the basin. And also it makes it possible to better delineate the basin, including active and connected aquifers and surface water issues involved and even have roots in groundwater related activities and impacts. Again, to recognize that we can no longer continue looking at surface water and groundwater in isolation. Next. The other issue is that water from the river may be lost through, gro through groundwater obstruction in a vicinity. Again, as we showed surface water groundwater interaction and again, lakes, rivers, and wetlands, and this actually water quality may be threatened by groundwater pollution. And further, that groundwater development may threaten traditional groundwater-based drinking water supplies, and transboundary groundwater management is needed to achieve sustainable development goals on buffer elevation, food security, climate change adaptation, and drought. And finally, that no action and transboundary cooperation may result without the benefits. So we need to look at all of these benefits holistically so that the member states can work together. Next. So this is the manual, again, the training manual developed integrating groundwater management into transboundary basin organization. Already the, 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 the modules that were developed have been presented, so I will not run through them again. Next. Again, Cooperation partners, these are a few, but we have been having many cooperation partners coming on board to move this agenda forward and they continue to increase. 
And we are happy that IGRAC has supported, IGRAC and UNESCO have supported this training. And we want to call upon other partners to come and support additional trainings. Next. Again, the modules have been highlighted, so let's continue. The next slide. Continue. So outlook for the module. Yeah, just go back outlook for the module. Again, as has been highlighted, it is available for you. So if you search on the internet, you will get it. Implementation of the training through various agencies and with support of Africa Groundwater Network. For those of you who are not yet members of Africa Groundwater Network, we really would want to call upon you to join so that we can develop that critical mass of groundwater professionals on the continent to move groundwater agenda forward. And again, we feel that these trainings could be held in collaboration with any international and regional organizations. That's why we are talking about, we have had trainings with BGR, with UNESCO, with the river basin organizations, with the regional economic communities, and of course, with the IGRAC. And the, as I said, since 2013, we have had a number of pilot trainings held in various locations, but we still have a lot to do because the capacity to manage and integrate groundwater and river basin organization is still very much limited. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Thank you, Kalist, for this uh, excellent presentation. Um, there will be a, a session for question and answers at the end of the morning. So I suggest we keep all our questions for later, uh, and then we can have uh, yeah, that discussion later. So I'd like to move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, this is from uh, Mustafa Diene, uh, Dr. Diene, on, uh, on groundwater-related uh, challenges. Uh, Merci uh, beaucoup, uh, Arno. Uh, Thank you very much, Arno. I'd like to share my screen. Yes. Can you see my screen? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I will focus my presentation on the challenges related to uh, the management of uh, groundwater, especially when it comes to environment, ecosystems linked to groundwater, and also uh, climate change and food security. Please allow me to cut my video so that the, I can use my bandwidth a bit better. Now, if those elements, here you see how water is distributed, like the colleagues earlier showed the importance of groundwater. When it comes to uh, global resources across the planet, here you could see that among all different types of water, uh, you have uh, fresh water, which is about a third, uh, which is uh, made up of uh, groundwater, which shows the importance of uh, this resource. On the life of uh, people across the world and also in Africa. Groundwater is not visible uh, because you cannot see it from the surface, the way you see a uh, surface water. That's water uh, that is found under our feet, which is uh, 
also a source that is uh, a bit uh, easier to access. You can find it uh, in many areas. And you could also have, uh, you can organize, you know, different methods to uh, uh, obtain this water. Its availability will depend on uh, hydrogeologic aspects, and we'll see how to have a very important diversity at uh, uh, global and African level. Mustafa, sorry, uh, some people in the chat are asking. We would like to to get the live translation in English. There is live translation in English. You only need to click in the bar in the bottom of the screen. There is a button interpretation. So you click on that button, then you select English, and you will have live translation of Mustafa's presentation in uh, in English. It's a bilingual uh, course. Uh, maybe some uh, attendees are surprised because we've uh, spoken English so far, but it's bi bilingual. Thank you, Mustafa, and sorry for the interruption. Merci, Arnaud. Thank you very much, Arnaud. You know, in West Africa, most countries speak French. We have uh, a lot of participants from our network who do not speak English, so it's good for us to present in French as well. Here you can see that you have uh, some examples of uh, uh, the diversity of the availability of water, and it could be identified uh, through some characteristics, including the uh, capacity, the storage capacity of aquifers. When you look at uh, the picture on your left, you have rocks that are not uh, consolidated. You got uh, sand and gravel, and they are very productive uh, aquifers. When you look at the other two ones, it's a more difficult environment because here yeah, those aquifers are not consolidated and they are made up of old rocks or they could also be uh, carbonate rocks. As you can see in the middle, some of the consolidated rocks, the, you have some open spaces and the capacity uh, is uh, limited. So because of the dissolution of water, and you can find yourself with uh, big open spaces because those uh, aquifers have more the storage capacity. You also have the advantages of uh, durability and so that. The, the, the pictures are showing you the example of uh, the diversity among aquifers with a different uh, storage capacity. And this uh, diversity could be also mapped. Here you have on the picture the geology environment in Africa. As you could see, the environment as we saw, we spoke about the crystalline basement is uh, the major one. And then you have a lot of populations uh, that rely on this type of uh, aquifers, which uh, also presents a number of constraints in terms of availability, in terms of reliability. 
and quantities. So you have a lot of uh, basins that are more productive, like uh, the sedimentary uh, rivers. So this is uh, the environment uh, across the continent. Now, the key issues around the management of groundwater in these environments. So the one issue is uh, really something that is um, the quantification of uh, the recharge rate because it shows the renewal of those uh, aquifers first to identify them and also see the composition of the soil and the protection of the aquifers, also the interactions with the environment. You have surface water and other ecosystems that depend on groundwater. The colleagues before me spoke about it, the impact uh, so of uh, the domestic and uh, farming use. Uh, so these are key issues that uh, managers have to ask themselves. Now the preservation, the conservation of quality, the quality of aquifers and the impact of human activity. Uh, it could be um, mining, it could be farming and others. Sometimes we do not control those elements for so their impact on uh, the water resources, especially uh, surface uh, water resources. Groundwater is also used for irrigation, so we need uh, uh, to see how they can um, sustain the needs so there are different options that we need to uh, look at in terms of uh, adapting to the use of uh, the groundwater. There are a number of questions that we need to ask ourselves. Now, when it comes to groundwater, like Calis said, it is uh, an important component of uh, the water cycle because we cannot manage groundwater in a way that is isolated to surface water. So we have to have a combined management of those water resources because of the interaction and the connection between the two whether it is with the environment or with the use of uh, groundwater that can impact on the environment. So the interconnection, the linkages could be uh, beneficial to uh, the people. It could also be a source of uh, contamination, so we have to uh, really pay attention to the relationship between the two for better management of water resources. Likewise, when we speak about uh, uh, ecosystems that depend on groundwater, you can see that uh, some ecosystems depend on groundwater. They can be defined as in those uh, areas, we have vegetation, we got wildlife and uh, the survival depend on groundwater. Likewise, you, you have uh, 
marine ecosystems and ground ecosystems uh, that depend on groundwater have to be preserved and we have to consider those in the management of water resources. The relationship is uh, shown in the images that you've seen in the previous presentations. So you can see the linkages between groundwater and the surface water. So that's why I don't want to take too much time on it. So the relationship is uh, controlled by uh, the and, uh, connectivity and uh, use uh, and uh, water plan and also the geometry and also the elevation of water levels to control the interaction between water uh, surface water and groundwater. We can find the same relationships also here uh, within the lakes and uh, other uh, streams, other rivers. Likewise, in uh, wetland, uh, like we said, they could receive uh, there is a relationship and what is uh, often the case is that the relationship is not um, always um, clear so after there is a degradation of uh, uh, the ecosystems then we notice uh, there was a relationship between uh, surface water or ecosystems and the uh, underground water. So uh, we have a lot of work to do. To acknowledge and to improve on the knowledge uh, on the linkages between ecosystems and the groundwater. So here are some of the activities uh, uh, the, that can really threaten groundwater, whether it is uh, over use of uh, groundwater when you have uh, overuse with uh, the water levels going down that could uh, cause uh, degradation of the environment and also when it comes to uh, uh, some of the aquifers it could cause uh, a problem in terms of um, the relationship or the interaction between surface water and groundwater that could impact on the groundwater uh, development and also agricultural expansion are also some of the drivers of um, that are affecting uh, groundwater and its availability. And also through the chemical products that are used that could uh, pollute uh, groundwater. In mining areas, we could uh, also have uh, some uh, results, uh, some negative results affecting uh, the availability of and the quality of ground 
what uh, we also need to consider this uh, sector, this mining sector, especially in Africa, in West Africa, where you have a lot of mining activity that is happening in areas where we could find ourselves with uh, large openings that affect uh, those uh, aquifers that benefit a huge uh, proportion of the population and also commercial and uh, urban arrangements where you have uh, this issue of sanitation, which means that uh, the, the surface uh, water sometimes uh, polluted because of activities. Here you have uh, a picture that could uh, summarize the activities that could really uh, be a threat to the availability of water, whether it is building the rivers, and you can see the relationship between the surface and the ground. So if surface water is uh, polluted, then groundwater could also be. You also have a poor drilling, which is also entry points for pollution and also intensive uh, farming that could be a source of pollution. Here, you also have to consider the impact of climate change, which is a reality, it's visible. So I don't think that someone can deny the existence of climate change with these uh, changes that it brings to our daily life our waters underground could be impacted and also there could be a source of adaptation to uh, climate change. So climate change is uh, shown through a modification of uh, some systems around the basins, and there is also high evaporation, which is uh, changing a number of things. Also, there is a change in terms of uh, rainfall. So all that can influence the cycle uh, together, the water cycle and also the level of water underground and within the aquifers. There's also population growth, which is another factor uh, in Africa. Uh, the population's growth is causing a growth in demand for water and also for uh, agricultural products. The larger the population, the more we need water and food and this could be uh, a threat. And also the use and the occupation of the soil, which could impact on the groundwater. The other thing is groundwater depends and responds a lot to climate change because of its ability to uh, is resilience. Uh, it means that uh, this could be really something we could use for resilience. Groundwater, which is uh, not deep enough, uh, sometimes is uh, vulnerable compared to the ones that are more uh, deep into the ground. So what we could see is uh, when it comes to climate change, there is um, 
a lower recharge rate and uh, a lower stocks or capacity. We could show uh, the resilience of groundwater on the picture. You can see the pointer when you have uh, a meteorological drought. You can see that surface water goes down while groundwater will take a bit of time before it registers um, lower levels. So this is something that could be used in adapting to uh, climate change and also uh, under uh, the co-management of surface and groundwater. So when there is a drought, we could uh, uh, use uh, the water that goes uh, into the ground. And then when there is a recharge, we can use again surface water. During a drought, then we can go back again to uh, groundwater use. So this is uh, what can be done. So these adaptation uh, options could also be done via a number of practices, like I said earlier, depending on availability and also the co-management of surface and groundwater in areas, uh, urban areas. Also, the management of aquifers recharge, and we need to set uh, or to modify the landscape or set the infrastructure to better manage those aquifers. So we need to find ways of uh, restocking in good areas to increase uh, recharge of water, uh, surface water. Something that I said earlier is around the use. People are building roads that are uh, crossing uh, those streams. And this could be also the opportunity to set up a dam or something like that. Uh, so these are the opportunities that we could use to increase uh, our adaptation to uh, climate change when it comes to groundwater. Very quickly, coming to irrigation, which is a very important element because in Africa, with the increase, the population growth, and also the issues of uh, food security, irrigation is also uh, developing in many areas of the continent. We do not have enough uh, surface water and we need uh, to use groundwater across the globe. You could see that the use of the groundwater is more um, used towards agriculture. About two thirds of groundwater used is for uh, agriculture across the globe. So a large amount goes to agriculture. Now, when it comes to water sources and their use, at global level, we can see that surface water is more used. Uh, again, for farming, 
also for industry and uh, for domestic use. So it's only for fresh water that uh, the use is more or less the balance between surface and groundwater. The good thing with groundwater is it's more or less available everywhere, while um, surface water is around uh, streams of water. So for you to develop uh, agriculture and irrigation, you really need to think about uh, the use of groundwater. Now looking across the globe, the use of uh, groundwater, it's more or less, if you see in red, groundwater is a bit more used in Asia, in Europe, in America than in Africa. You see in Africa, besides uh, the north and the south of the continent, groundwater is not, I mean, it's relatively not uh, used that much compared to other countries and other regions of the globe. In Africa, a number of countries have arid areas where development is a bit low, but that's true. But what we notice is the use of groundwater is not at a high level. Now, in countries where they use groundwater at a high rate, you can see that uh, there is a, a good coverage of uh, food security in those areas. That shows as well, in Africa, we still have a lot of work to do, but we have to learn from the lessons of the countries that are using uh, groundwater a bit more. In Asia, for instance, where you have uh, overuse, it has an impact on the ecosystem. So we do not have to forget that aspect, but we have to use groundwater to develop uh, agriculture in a responsible way. So on the continent, you only have about 5% of uh, the uh, surface that is irrigated compared to India with 50%. So why do we need to use groundwater for agriculture? There's a number of advantages. First, it's available almost everywhere. You have more efficiency. You could have irrigation throughout the year and you are more resilient against uh, drought and also we could use it uh, as an individual and uh, another external element is to satisfy uh, the needs uh, of the growing population and people also want to have a higher standard of life. We now have uh, pumps that are more advanced and that are more reliable. And also we could use solar energy with those pumps and that could help to fight against poverty and uh, to ensure uh, food safety. In Africa, you know, rural electrification is still low. Uh, what could be the weaknesses when it comes to uh, irrigation. The advantage that we said is it's available everywhere and it could be used at individual level. But it's also a challenge because it's difficult to control and to manage. Also, there is higher 
competition uh, for those resources. And that could be a problem for the environment. And in some areas in Senegal, you have some uses for domestic uh, use, but then at the end it goes into other activities as well, and uh, there is overuse. In Africa, you also have this low uh, rate of electrification, and that could cause uh, uh, limited use of um, groundwater for irrigation. Now, to overcome this, we need to have uh, pre-feasibility studies. We need to uh, assess how much quantity could be uh, drawn without uh, causing damage uh, to the resource and to the environment. We also need to uh, monitor the impact. We need to have more information on the, the quantities that could be used without affecting the resource. Also, we need to consider protection and the renewal of the resource. Thank you very much, Arnaud. Thank you, Mustafa. I was about to tell you that you need to wrap up, but luckily you finished earlier. So now it's 11 o'clock. This is the time uh, to break for half an hour, and we're coming back at half past 11 in 30 minutes with the other presentations. Now, please keep your questions, and we're going to have a short discussion towards the end for about 30 minutes to uh, discuss with Mustafa and the other presenters. Thank you, and see you just now.
Hello. Hey. Yeah. Oh, okay, my boy. Yeah, well, I think it's you. See you. You have what you get money. You feel like you're bad now? Oh, okay.
Calma, calma, calma.
So uh, it is time to resume the, the course. Uh, I hope you all had a, a good break uh, and that you're back uh, for the next presentations. Um, Professor Gourmesa will be on our next presenter. Uh, we'll make a, a presentation on groundwater quality uh, in river basins. Um, over to you, uh, Seifu. Thank you, Arno. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I would like to thank uh, EGRAC and UNESCO and Greta for uh, organizing this uh, training session. And I will be glad uh, this morning to share with you uh, some thoughts on groundwater quality in the context of uh, uh, river basins. And uh, my presentation will take about 20 minutes and uh, I'll leave the 10 minutes for uh, discussion. So uh, my name is Saifu Kapadu Gumesa. I'm also the vice president for the International Association of Hydrogeologists for Sub-Saharan Africa region. This slide, I took it from the World Water Quality Assessment uh, Alliance uh, perspective paper recently uh, published. And it shows, or it really repeats uh, what uh, my colleagues have uh, said this morning about groundwater, Alist, uh, Mustafa, uh, and uh, Moshud. Uh, it it uh, highlights the importance of uh, groundwater globally and up to 50% of uh, global population depend on groundwater for uh, drinking water sources. And 40% of uh, irrigated agriculture rely on uh, groundwater sources. And uh, groundwater has also some very strong linkage with economic uh, status of uh, countries. It affects economic uh, status of countries. And uh, as uh, Moshud uh, rightly said, uh, groundwater relates to at least 10 SDG targets or water in general uh, relate to 10 uh, SDG targets of the 2030 agenda. And groundwater sustains ecosystems such as wetlands, estuaries, lakes, uh, and riverine uh, ecosystems. Uh, so it has, has a significance as well and uh, the capacity of aquifers to buffer uh, climate change is also widely uh, researched and widely understood these days. And uh, for instance, uh, across uh, Africa, uh, there are uh, recent studies demonstrating that in under future climate change or climate variability, whereby rainfall becomes more intense uh, and uh, rainfall intensity increases, or short duration rains, then uh, this kind of rainfall pattern would lead to enhancement in groundwater recharge. So even under climate change, uh, groundwaters have some capacity to both buffer uh, the, the impacts as well as uh, they also, groundwaters also benefit, could benefit from future climate uh, variability. So future climate variability is about where to put the water. It, it affects the water balance and when the water balance is affected, maybe the soil becomes drier and the rivers become drier, but the groundwater will become more uh, relatively abundant. This is a recent study by Cuthbert uh, from UK who demonstrated this uh, clearly by taking multiple uh, regions in Africa. Regardless of these benefits, uh, groundwater is also under pressure, uh, both from climate change and human activities. And uh, thus, protecting groundwater resources means protecting health, protecting, maintaining food supplies, and conservation of the ecosystem. Unfortunately, uh, groundwater is hidden uh, resource, and it's poorly understood, and also uh, poorly managed, and uh, sometimes difficult to, to manage because of this wider spatial uh, availability. So, uh, there is this general consensus among um, groundwater hydrologists, hydrogeologists, and those who advocate for uh, to see the role of groundwater in socioeconomic transformation of countries. But when we talk of groundwater or surface water, we talk of two things. 
One is quantity and the other one is quality. In the past, when you say groundwater has been given less emphasis compared to surface waters among river basin organizations, the same applies also to when you talk of the quantity, quality uh, dimensions. Groundwater, also, sorry, water quality has been given less attention compared to water quantity. So, but is water quality important? What is the importance of water quality and why we need at multiple levels, at basin organizations, aquifer regions, in countries or in catchments, why is groundwater quality or water quality important in, in general? Number one, there are many reasons, of course. There is a clear linkage between poor water quality and GDP or economic status of countries. Poor water quality harms economic status of countries. And it lowers, okay, the recent World Bank report shows that water quality lowers Poor water quality lowers the GDP of countries by nearly a third. Up to one third of economic gains or GDP of countries can disappear because of poor water quality or the water quality impacts. Okay, and the poor water quality impact is felt across all nations, poor and wealthy nations as well. If you see this graph, very interesting graph relating. GDP growth or GDP of countries versus biological oxygen demand. This is taken from the World Bank report. It shows that when the economic status of countries is low, when GDP is low, the environmental impact on water quality is not yet substantially felt. Okay, the biological oxygen demand of the, the waters is low, the economic status of the countries is low. But countries follow uh, a very uh, unsustainable path in most cases, because as the GDP increases, then or as the biological oxygen demand, uh, so as GDP increases, the pollution level also increases, and the pollution level in in the streams, in the lakes, in uh, in, in the water systems keeps the GDPs to not to grow faster. Okay, not to grow or not to be sustainable. But some countries with advanced economies have or can invest on their water quality management and um, integrated water resources management in general and can reach or can attain high GDP growth, even high GDP growth by keeping even the water quality at its best status. So for Africa, the question is, how can we move from this state of low GDP and generally, you know, at basin scale or a large aquifer scale, low pollution levels, how can we move from this state to a more higher GDP levels, but without causing or without being dragged by poor water quality? So this is an important uh, question. And then uh, uh, this is important, demonstrates the importance of uh, uh, water quality for uh, economic uh, well-being of countries. And poor water quality also has direct or indirect relation with people's health. Poor water quality shortens people and shortens life. The, uh, what you call uh, the life expectancy uh, of people decreases uh, because of poor water quality or contaminated water sources because of diseases associated with uh, poor water quality. And it affects human brain, it affects human physical uh, makeup. So there is uh, increasing evidence that uh, poor water quality affects individual health, mental and physical health. And this will have cross-generational impact, not only now, not only for that person, so it keeps people poor, and if people get poor, they will be poorer also in the future. So this has a cross-generational uh, impact of uh, poor water quality. And on food production, uh, annually, uh, land 
which could uh, feed up to 170 million people is lost to saline uh, or salinization because of uh, uh, poor water quality uh, and poor water quality affecting food production like uh, the area you see here affected by salt grows in, in the soils by application of uh, poor irrigation practice and poor water quality. And then in this century, we are also in new unknown domain, whereby uh, there are several unknown new pollutants emerging every day. Uh, and these uh, new pollutants, the impact of which is sometimes difficult to understand, and even measurement of uh, these pollutants is difficult uh, to, to, to do, but uh, there are growing evidence that emerging contaminants such as pharmaceutical compounds, hormones, PFASs, drug-resistant bacteria, viruses, including COVID, microplastics, and synthetic fibers are gradually um, uh, are being introduced into, into the environment. And currently, uh, we are kind of, people are struggling to, to know first to measure what is happening and where do we have this pollution happening? And at the same time, what is the impact of it? And then uh, when we look into Africa, when we look into Africa, there are evidences, particularly from agricultural areas and urban areas that emerging contaminants are on the rise. So in, uh, the problem of emerging contaminants is not restricted to uh, developed countries or Northern and Western countries, but it is also happening in, in, in more so in, in Africa because of lack of regulation and the lack of uh, control on substance movement and substance uh, use such as uh, pharmaceutical compounds and other chemicals. So having said this, you know, water quality impacting uh, the environment, water quality impacting human health, GDP, and it is related to you know, human life and uh, livelihoods. And then when we see examples from Africa, uh, there are many examples whereby poor water quality impacts uh, human, human health and economies. I'll, I'll give you some examples here. This is uh, a widely uh, well-known problem for instance, the problem of fluoride, high fluoride level impacting millions of people, you know, dozens of millions of people in, uh, in many regions in Africa. Uh, this is a natural uh, poor water quality problem, geogenic contaminant, and uh, due to this uh, fluoride contamination of groundwaters, uh, people have uh, poor, um, dental mottling, delta fluoresis, and in some cases it causes uh, skeletal fluoresis, and then people are not able to work or walk, and it causes physical impairment. So millions of people, not one or two million, but uh, 60, 70 million, and maybe even more people are exposed to the risk of high fluoride in, in nature. So this is not restricted into fluoride uh, these days in Africa. There is a problem related to high nitrate levels. There is problem related to arsenic and problem related to salinity, et cetera. But as a matter of fact, uh, the excess of certain elements, as much excess of certain elements causes problems, deficiency of certain elements in, in groundwater or in the water that we drink has also impact on, on health. The figure you see here is, uh, Guiter, the ladies uh, with uh, guiter uh, because of iodine deficiency. And uh, there are several evidences linking uh, guiter prevalence in, for instance, in Ethiopia to environmental availability of iodine in groundwaters. So in mountain areas, highlands, whereby the environmental availability of iodine is limited and people are poor and not afford, uh, do not afford to buy iodized salts, et cetera, you see this prevalence of uh, guiter, millions of people affected by, by this problem. So it is not only just this, the, the abundance uh, of certain health 
related uh, substances, but also deficiency of uh, certain others can also have uh, impacts like selenium, for instance, uh, iodine is one. And a recent study demonstrates that, for instance, among Kenyan uh, pastoral communities in Kenya and probably also in Ethiopia, in the Little Kana region, people drink high salinity waters and uh, measurement of the health status of these people exposed to high groundwater salinity demonstrate that high level of hypertension and then hyperdilute urine among uh, these communities. So hypertension, uh, you know, this is an important observation in publication. Uh, the thing is we don't have as of yet, a, you know, a clear idea or, you know, on individual iron bases. What is the impact of this iron on this, uh, on people? Okay. We need to further do more, more research on that. But this one is demonstrating, for instance, very nicely, the clinical uh, study demonstrating salinity related to hypertension. So salinity is not only an agricultural problem or it's not a palatability problem, it is also a health problem. Okay, you, if salinity level is high, you don't drink it, but if you drink it, you'll become, it's not drinkable, it's not tasty, but it can also have uh, health impacts. And high salinity level also leads to uh, closure or abandonment of boreholes upon drilling, you know, sometimes it's drillable or very deep boreholes, and then the borehole turns eventually the water that comes out turns saline, and then you are forced to abandon it. You cannot use it, or you need in the rural setting desalination technology, which is for a rural uh, village, maybe very uh, expensive. Uh, you know, maybe the cost is going down, desalination cost, but it has significant salinity, has significant impact on. Uh, borehole success rate. And this example is a compilation from Ethiopia and uh, Somalia and Kenya on the uh, abandonment of boreholes up on drying, up or up on uh, drilling because of high salinity levels. Uh, and as you can see, up to in some places in uh, the IGAD region, Horn of Africa region, up to 50, 70, even, and even 80 percent of boreholes drilled in, in certain environments, in certain geologies, are abandoned because of high salinity. So, so it impacts borehole success rates uh, as well. And then uh, some uniqueness of uh, groundwater quality. Uh, so generally, this is a, a, a slide I took from uh, Albert Twinoff. You can get it from this link uh, shown uh, below. So when you compare groundwaters and surface waters, there are some uh, differences, some good uh, differences. Uh, aquifers generally contain high or good water quality, but surface waters are generally variable water quality. And pollution vulnerability, groundwaters are less vulnerable and surface waters are more so. And once polluted, that is the thing, once groundwater is polluted, it is, difficult to restore, but surface water pollution is transitory. Maybe sooner we stop the pollution, pollution causing activities, the rivers can restore back to where uh, they naturally were. But uh, it takes a long time for groundwater to, to, to recover uh, and go back to its natural status. So with respect to River basins and lake basins, uh, what is important about water quality? So what is the context here? As uh, my colleagues rightly put this morning, surface water and groundwater are interconnected. They are interconnected and they are a single resource. Okay, But there may be conditions or cases whereby we have only in hyper arid, very arid environments, we don't have surface waters. You know, case, for instance, in Northern Africa. But in many other regions, even then, even there, uh, you have losing streams uh, feeding the, uh, the aquifers. So surface waters are ground, uh, surface waters and ground waters are generally interconnected. And the groundwater that goes into the river takes 
from days to millennium uh, years to, to reach the surface water. And then this will mean if, you, if the groundwater quality is impacted, the surface water quality is going to be impacted and vice versa. And there is a number of emerging uh, evidence that water resource development of one, let's say groundwater, impacting the water quality of rivers and surface water development impacting the groundwater quality. So I'll show you, I'll give you some examples, maybe three or four examples in the next slides, how the interlinkage between the two has, uh, uh, has uh, impact on each other. This is an example from uh, Ethiopian Rift Valley, whereby we have multiple lakes. So in lake basins, let me highlight the point first. In lake basins, the water quality of lakes is the function of two things. The first thing is the water balance. If the water balance of the catchment is changed, not the water quality, just the water balance, think of the volume of water. If the volume of water flowing in the catchment, from the catchment to the lake and from the lake to, let's say the groundwater or to uh, rivers that exist the lake is changed, the water quality of the lake is also going to be changed without even changing the quality of individual water flux or individual water which is coming into the lake, the quality of lakes, the ground, or sorry, the water quality of lakes can be impacted by hydrological changes alone. Let me show you with this uh, graph here. As evaporative water loss increases, this one shows evaporative water loss with respect to their uh, inflow for lakes. And this is a concentration in milligram per liter for individual ions. Generally, for conservative ions, as evaporative water loss increases, then the concentration also increases. For instance, for chloride, electrical conductivity, salinity, these are conservative uh, substances in water. So with evaporative water loss, with respect to the inflow, then the concentration increases. So if you disturb, the, if the evaporative uh, water loss is disturbed because of the water balance changes, then the salinity of the lakes also changes. There are many examples from Rift Valley environment whereby the water quality and the, particularly the salinity has changed over a period of time in response to hydrological changes and the hydrological changes caused by both climate and human activities. So this means water quality is not separable from the water quantity. So basic river, uh, river basin organizations must give due attention to it because disturbances in one will cause disturbances in, in the other. This is an example uh, to, that substantiates my, uh, my argument here. But maybe before discussing about this, let me go back to the previous slide here. You know, uh, among, I don't know, maybe there are people from geology or paleoclimate uh, attending this uh, lecture and this training. There is uh, one saying among paleo uh, hydrology or paleo climate communities. Lakes are gigantic rain gauges. Okay? We can consider lakes as gigantic rain gauges, meaning lakes can tell us about processes in, in the catchment, what processes is taking place. The, pres the pressures in, in the environment can be felt in, in the lake. And then we are observing many changes in the lake, many uh, chemical changes in uh, water quality changes in, in many lakes in, in Africa, demonstrating that okay, catchment changes and catchment processes are being uh, impacted. So this example here, is from the Awash River Basin. The Awash River Basin is one of the most developed river basin in uh, Ethiopia, arid, arid region and humid part here. And these are various aquifers. The river is flowing like this here. So this is the river and the values you see here are electrical conductivity or salinity of the river as you go from the highland to the lower place. And you see regions where the main river shows very high electrical conductivity. 
Hello, can you please uh, unmute yourself? Uh, those of you who have, uh, yeah, yes, thank you very much. So you see high ultra conductivity here in, in, in the river and this high ultra conductivity, which cannot be used for irrigation anymore, is caused by an irrigation activity somewhere here. And that irrigation activity led to uh, upwelling of saline groundwater, okay? Groundwater level came up because of the input from irrigation excess water. And this saline groundwater started to discharge into the river and then causing salinization of uh, the downstream. So millions of people affected, you know, hundreds of thousands of hectares of land affected because of this high salinity caused by poor irrigation practice and groundwater entering into the river system. So in the river system, interventions of this sort, diversions, uh, constructions of large infrastructure like dams and reservoirs would eventually lead to changes in water quality as well. There are many examples globally from China, from Australia, from arid regions whereby water quantity changes because of water allocation results in uh, water quality problems, both from agricultural input and from salinization. For instance, if you see here, high salinity waters in this water uh, river, downstream further there you have low salinity. This is thanks to a river that is entering this, uh, at, at, this, at this place here. So it dilutes, it keeps dilute. Imagine that this river is Employ, uh, utilized for irrigation, then this salinity would, would increase. So allocation of water between different users can eventually impact the water quality, not only the water quantity. So it's just to highlight and to re-emphasize, you know, the importance of uh, con the need for consideration of uh, uh, water quality. This is uh, an example from the Nile Valley. Uh, a recent study we have con conducted for uh, intro. And if you see um, along the major irrigation areas in Sudan, you see zones of very high salinity in the irrigation areas. And then this groundwater salinization is attributed to irrigation return water, irrigation excess water that salinizes, that enters into the groundwater and salinizes it. And this problem is common, not only in the, in the Sudan, it is common also in Egypt, in the Nile Valley and in the Nile Delta region. So any, uh, let's say, uh, interventions like uh, water allocation issues must be also discussed in terms of water quality, not just water quantity. So uh, this is uh, very important for uh, river basin organizations. So what are the policies and responses countries are taking with, for water quality. I'll take salinity as, a, as an example, what different African countries do to, to manage or to deal with uh, salinity problems, for instance. Existing policies or practices, for instance, is that relaxation of water quality standards. In many countries, particularly in Horn of Africa countries, uh, the electrical conductivity that is permitted for drinking, the WHO guideline is expanded from 1,000, 1,500 to 3,000. People drink or, you know, constructors can build uh, wells, even uh, if the, the electrical conductivity level is uh, 3,000 micro siemens. So relaxation of the water quality guidelines. Some countries follow that uh, policy and some revert to unsafe sources like uh, rivers, riverbed excavations, because of uh, palatability issues with uh, high salinity groundwaters. And in some regions, maybe like Tunisia and South Africa, there are intentional uh, practices of uh, managed aquifer recharge to keep salinity of uh, groundwaters low. And uh, in South Africa, for instance, uh, inject uh, wastewater into coastal environments to protect intrusion of uh, marine uh, water into, into the aquifers. Biosaline bio agriculture is being practiced in MENA region. But what are possible other technical measures? 
for instance, expansion of uh, uh, managed aquifer recharge, both for quantity and quality purpose in arid environments, groundwater quality safe, safe sourcing, a better understanding of the hydrogeology. For instance, there are regions in alluvial aquifers whereby high salinity groundwater is sitting nearby a very dilute groundwater. So that is that, that assists on hydrogeological reasons. And if those reasoning of the patterns in sal salinity is understood, one can find low salinity environments in otherwise high salinity uh, groundwater regions. And uh, that is uh, what we call groundwater quality safe sourcing. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I propose to Neno, to IGRAC and UNESCO, you know, how to kind of guideline on safe sourcing of uh, high salinity. Uh, it's, uh, something that we can think in, uh, in the future. Then irrigation water management, uh, soil total tolerant agriculture and blending of water sources, uh, et cetera, can be done in um, technical measures, okay, to, to deal with high water salinity problems. So finally, the key message, uh, here, I took this key, key message from uh, the World, uh, World Water Quality as, uh, Alliance perspective paper. Uh, I was one of uh, the co-authors, the last co-author in, uh, in that list. So uh, I'll, I'll uh, give you some highlights from uh, that message. What are the key messages? So give increased attention to groundwater quality at most importance for achievement of SDGs. Groundwater quality has clear linkage water quality has clear linkage to SDG, so give attention to water quality. Dedicate groundwater quality assessment. Dedicated water quality assessment is necessarily and timely, but difficult, <laughs> you know. And uh, groundwater systems are heterogeneous, three-dimensional water reservoirs in complex rock formation. Contaminant transport and remediation involving long-term time scales. Mapping contaminant distribution is challenging. Information and data exchange and data quality, groundwater quality are very variable across the globe. Often less information available in countries or on global south and substantial efforts are needed for a comparable global assessment. So important new advances are becoming more common. Yeah, this is very important. For instance, Earth observa uh, observation like satellites and uh, drones citizen science, machine learning uh, for predictive uh, water quality mapping and numerical modeling. These are, this can complement the, the challenges that, that we face in uh, understanding the global pattern in uh, individual water quality uh, parameters or their distribution with time and space. And uh, these new frontiers uh, should be explored in the future to fill the large data gap and the knowledge, uh, knowledge gap. So, and uh, I finish my presentation here and thank you very much. Oh, I took 30 minutes. Th thank you, Sifu. Uh, don't worry about the time, we are, we are okay with that. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. Um, and again, I suggest uh, uh, that we keep our questions for later. Or uh, maybe to yeah, there will be time to to engage in uh, in a short discussion. Um, so for now, let's move to the next uh, and last presentation of um, of today from my colleague uh, Christina Fraser on transboundary aquifers. Thank you. I know I'll just share my screen. Uh, can everyone see that okay? Yes, Christina. Perfect, great. So um, I'm Christina Fraser. I'm a researcher at IGRAC and I'm just gonna go briefly over some slides about transboundary aquifers. So really back to the basics, what is a transboundary aquifer? Well, the legal definition is an aquifer or an aquifer system part of which are situated in different states. So on a more technical level, that essentially means that the aquifer is shared between two or more countries. And more specifically, there's a transboundary flow of groundwater. So groundwater is flowing across a border. And there's um, just some uh, schematics there on the screen for you to, to be able to illustrate that in a more visual way. 
Um, yeah, so there's actually different types of transboundary aquifer. And th I guess the most basic is a fossil aquifer that isn't connected at all to um, surface waters and that travels across the border. But in most cases, we do see that these transboundary aquifers are connected to surface waters hydraulically in some way. So whether this is the fact that um, a river forms the border between two countries, as does happen in quite a few um, countries within Africa, or simply that the aquifer itself is transboundary, but it's connected hydraulically to a domestic river. Because the situation gets then a little bit more complicated when you have a transboundary aquifer that is also hydraulically connected to a transboundary river. And then you can get even more complex situations where the system is connected to transboundary recharge or, or even the possibility that a domestic aquifer is recharged by um, transboundary recharge. So the aquifer itself may not be transboundary, but it's part of an overall transboundary system. So why is it important to understand and manage these transboundary aquifers? Well, essentially, the actions on one side of the border from one country can have implications and impacts for the other side. And these impacts can include a reduction in groundwater levels throughout the aquifer if um, heavy pumping or unsustainable pumping is being undertaken. That can even lead to changes in groundwater flow patterns um, and in some extreme cases when groundwater might naturally flow from one country to another, that, that um, flow can then be reversed across the border. There's also implications of contaminating groundwater within a transboundary aquifer because that contamination can then flow across the border into a neighbouring country. And similarly, as I just mentioned, many transboundary aquifers are connected to surface water systems and uh, impact on the aquifer can then affect the surface water that's connected to it. So for example, you could, um, if you're experiencing over pumping with an aquifer, that could lead to some rivers drying up and um, subsequent consequences for that. Ultimately, these issues can lead to tension and conflict between countries. And not only that, it can have really serious implications for communities, cities who are relying on those groundwater resources as their primary drinking source or for agriculture, irrigation. So what's the current understanding of transboundary aquifers globally? Well, there's been 366 transboundary aquifers currently identified globally, and that's presented on the map that you can see on your screen. But there's likely many, many more that we haven't yet identified. And there's probably many more that are very, very small and only really are important at the local level. But at that local level, they could be sustaining livelihoods, communities. So it's, it's important to recognise that although we've mapped 366, that's not necessarily the entire picture. We then have 266 groundwater bodies within the EU. And these are slightly different to transboundary aquifers because they're um, being identified as managerial units within under the Water Framework Directive. So this essentially means that an, a transboundary aquifer could be split into three, maybe four um, managerial units that are ad identified as groundwater bodies. And currently we have 266 of those identified within the European Union. So zooming in a bit to the Africa situation, we have um, 72 transboundary aquifers that have been mapped. And um, this is really from a variety of initiatives and projects that have been conducted in the region. One of the main um, contributing initiatives was the Transboundary Water Assessment Programme. And that assessed transboundary aquifers at a global level using a variety of indicators. Various aquifer briefs were developed um, for that project, and that really helped move forward the understanding and assessment of transboundary aquifers worldwide, but also particularly in Africa. So what about transboundary aquifers and lake and river basins? Well, if you look at this map here, this is uh, an image of transboundary aquifer systems superimposed onto 
international river basins across Africa. And what you can see is, firstly, transboundary aquifers re represent a very large proportion of the continental area across Africa, um, around 42%, and that accounts for 30% of the population. So, you know, a large proportion of groundwater resources within Africa are transboundary. And then when you look at the um, correlation between transboundary aquifers and river and lake basins, you know, sometimes the transboundary aquifers do um, reside completely within um, one river or lake basin, but quite often, not only are these transboundary aquifers, but there's a transboundary component in the sense that it's crossing more than one lake or river basin. And that's quite common because, you know, groundwater doesn't necessarily always co correlate with surface water. And that's an important aspect to be considered um, when you're looking to manage the resource. Just to zoom in as an example, this is the Nile River Basin with its transboundary aquifers overlaid. And you can see that, well, there's firstly a range of different sizes. Some are small, some are very, very big. There's also a, a very diverse range of hydrogeology. Um, and also there's a range of use for the groundwater within these transboundary aquifers. So how do we manage transboundary aquifers? Well, the first key is first to understand transboundary aquifers and to identify where they are, how big they are, um, and then whether there's a transboundary groundwater flow component. But on top of the more technical aspects of um, an assessment of an aquifer, you also need to consider socioeconomic aspects, governance, environmental aspects, and, um, and again, like I mentioned, surface water connections. So we'll talk more tomorrow about the specific types of data that go into groundwater um, assessments, because really the type of data that you're collecting is going to be the same for um, a domestic aquifer as it is for a transboundary aquifer. But what complicates it when you look at the more transboundary context is that often data collected for transboundary aquifer assessments is on the, na the national scale. It can be collect collected in different ways. Um, different names for different hydrogeological units could be used. And there's a real need to then harmonize that data in order to get a clearer transboundary picture. So just for example, on the left of the screen there is a geological map um, where we've tried to match the geology on one side of the border within Malawi to another side of the border in Mozambique. And you can see that it doesn't always match and harmonizing those geology, the hydrogeology and all the other data between the countries is quite a difficult task, a very important one if you want to understand the aquifer at a transboundary level. Uh, moving on from that, um, it's essential that countries are able to share data between each other in order to manage effectively. And again, we'll talk about this more tomorrow specifically, but just to mention that you know, information systems are a really great way to share and host data, particularly when these systems are online, because it means that data is not being stored and hosted in a national database and it can be accessed from many different um, riparian states who have a stake within the aquifer. Um, an example is the GGIS, the Global Groundwater Information System that IGREC have developed. And um, again, my colleague will talk about this more tomorrow, but just a note to say that if you go onto the platform, you can see the current map um, the global map of transboundary aquifers across the world, and you can zoom in and look and get more information about each aquifer. So that's quite a nice resource if you want to learn more about the specific transboundary aquifers within your country and um, look at the key players that, that you, you might need to cooperate with moving forward in order to manage the resource. Monitoring is also essential within a transboundary context. However, much like um, data, Monitoring is often done at a national level. So there's a real need to establish transboundary monitoring networks 
that specifically look at the transboundary component of um, potential groundwater flow changes and groundwater quality changes within the system in order to be able to manage it effectively. And um, another one of my colleagues, Claudia, will, will speak a bit more about monitoring tomorrow. Ultimately, none of this can happen unless there's cooperation between countries. And it's absolutely key that that is a foundation for assessment and management of transboundary aquifers. Cooperation has um, within transboundary aquifers has actually been brought kind of to the international platform recently through the establishment of um, the Sustainable Development Goals, because in Goal 6.5 that calls for integrated water resource management, it specifically in, um, identifies that that should be including transboundary cooperation if it's appropriate. But unfortunately, um, a lot of the reports that have come out of the SDG so far have indicated that there really is still a severe insufficient knowledge on groundwater systems. So it's very difficult to create agreements and to manage an aquifer um, in a transboundary context if you don't have enough understanding and knowledge of the system in the first place. So what are the legal mechanisms that we can look to internationally um, if we want to foster agreements over transboundary aquifers? Well, there are a few. Um, first is the UN Convention on the Law of Non-Navigational Uses of, of International Watercourses. Now, this um, convention, it was primarily designed as a convention for surface water. So therefore, um, groundwater that's not hydraulically connected to surface water isn't considered within the convention. So for example, fossil aquifers um, that have no connection to rivers, they're, they're not gonna fall under the scope of that convention. Secondly, we have the Convention on the Protection and Use of Transboundary Watercourses and Lakes. And that does cover both um, surface water and groundwater. It was originally a European convention, but it's now global. And it's additionally supported by a series of model provisions that are specifically related to transboundary aquifer um, agreements and management and cooperation. We then have the UN draft articles on transboundary aquifers, which are groundwater specific and they're specifically designed for transboundary aquifers. Um, but they're not legally binding and they've been annexed to UN General Assembly resolution, but they still can provide really great guidance on how um, a transboundary aquifer agreement could be fostered. And, and a really good example is the um, Guarani Aquifer Agreement that um, came into force last year that was based on the transboundary um, draft articles. If you want a more regional um, example, you could look at the SADC revised protocol on shared water courses. And that is a region-wide um, protocol that looks to foster cooperation on um, the management and use of transboundary groundwater um, that is hydraulically connected to surface waters. But when we look at managing and maybe ultimately even create an agreement over the use of groundwater within transboundary aquifers, we really need to consider scale. Um, many transboundary aquifers across the world are actually very, very big. So this is a really good example from Europe. And you can see the, in the blue area on my screen, if you can see my cursor, this is a large sedimentary aquifer that really spans across many, many countries. And when you're looking to manage an aquifer like this, you really have to ask, well, is pumping or contamination from one side of this aquifer, is it going to affect the other side at such large regional scales? Likelihood is probably not. So we really need to consider at what level we want to manage the aquifer, whether it's appropriate to have an agreement or a management structure for the entire aquifer, or whether it might be better and more effective to identify specific management zones around smaller areas of the aquifer that might be closer to the border that might actually directly be impacted by um, groundwater use and groundwater contamination from a neighboring country. Again, another example, um, 
this time from Africa, is the, the Stamprete, which um, has a series, it's basically a multi-layered aquifer system. And some of these layers are fairly continuous across the entire system, but some are discontinuous and aren't connected to each other. So in these kind of situations, you need to consider, again, are we going to try to manage the entire system or only the, the aquifer layers that are hydraulically connected across the entire basin? Um, or, or do you want to ultimately try to manage the entire thing as a, as a hydraulically connected unit? So management of transboundary aquifers within a lake and river basin organization context. Well, it's clear that transboundary aquifers are a vital component, component of lake and river basins, particularly if they're hydraulically connected, which they often are. However, lake and river basin organizations are fairly limited by capacity, financing, and also, as we discussed earlier, there's the issue of um, transboundary aquifers that don't necessarily completely fit within one single river and lake basin organization. And actually there was a study done a few years back that looked at this, and there's only 22 aquifers um, across Africa that are fully encompassed within one river or lake basin organization. So that then poses the question, what do we do for the other transboundary aquifers across Africa that don't fit nicely within to one river basin organization to, in order to be managed just within that one organization? There's also the consideration of what do we do about fossil aquifers that aren't connected to surface waters and therefore don't really fall under the mandate of river lake um, basin organizations. An example um, of effective transboundary aquifer management within um, down at the river lake basin organization level would be the Stamprete transboundary aquifer system. Um, and this is a system that's shared by Botswana, South Africa and Namibia. And it lies entirely within Arasicom and Therefore, you know, we don't have those problems um, previously mentioned about potentially transboundary river lake basin organizations and the cooperation between them. And what has been established is a multi-country cooperation mechanism in order to establish joint governance and management for the aquifer. And that mechanism currently supports groundwater data collection and exchange between countries sharing that specific transboundary aquifer at the river lake and um, river lake basin organization level and then the long term goal for that mechanism would be to permanently embed it um, to foster further cooperation within the region so um, just some considerations to reflect on as i close and maybe some some things that could be discussed a bit earlier a bit later but um you know, we still don't know everything about transboundary aquifers. So what can we do within the region to really make steps and progressing towards a better understanding in order to then manage aquifers better? Ultimately, aquifer assessment is essential for this progress. And this again needs to be supported by monitoring and data sharing. And it really needs to be underbedded by cooperation. River, and lake basin organizations could really take the lead in some of these transboundary aquifer assessments and management, um, management across Africa, but only in some circumstances. And there's, you know, as we discussed, some, some aquifers that don't really fall within the remit of um, river basin organizations. However, there are already good examples of um, transboundary cooperation for aquifers through river basin organizations, and we should take the lessons learned from them moving forward. And we also should really take advantage of the current momentum around transboundary aquifer cooperation that has really been kind of elevated since the establishment of the SDG targets that focus around transboundary aquifer management, because um, managing transboundary aquifers is ultimately going to assist in the management of more local and national groundwater management. And it's probably a really good way to try and establish funding um, in order to manage groundwater resources in general throughout the region. Um, 
And finally, I just kind of listed a bunch of um, papers and reports that might be useful if you want to learn a bit more about transboundary act for assessment and management um, within the region. So maybe you can take a photo of it or um, I'm sure the slides will be shared as well at some point after the course. So that's me. Um, and I think now we're going to move on to the um, question and answer and discussion section of the of the day. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Um, thank you for your, your great presentation. Uh, and actually time for, uh, for a discussion, uh, questions and, and answers. We have a bit more than half an hour. Um, so we'll ask uh, the people who are interested to, uh, to say something, to ask questions, to, to raise their hand in, um, and then we can uh, uh, give, them, give them the possibility to, uh, to speak to the others. Um, and before that, I just wanted to, to add on, on the, last, uh, the last point of your last slide, not the, the list of references, but uh, when you say that there is indeed a momentum on uh, transboundary aquifers, and that is an, an opportunity for river basin organizations. I think that's, that's, very, that, that, that's really true. Um, because we're not saying that uh, transboundary aquifers are more relevant than any other groundwater for airbios. Airbios, they need to, to, to care about groundwater in general, every groundwater within the, the boundaries of the, of the basin that includes, that can include transboundary aquifers, but also other non-transboundary uh, groundwater. Everything is relevant. But we've noticed that um, the major breakthrough has been made in some river basin organizations uh, regarding groundwater assessment and groundwater management, that breakthrough came uh, via studies and projects on transboundary aquifers. Because um, yeah, there is a momentum, there is attention uh, on those uh, transboundary aquifers. Uh, for obvious reason, uh, the support of uh, LBOs is asked to, to address transboundary aquifers. So that can be a good entry point for LBOs um, to mobilize uh, funding to get uh, attention and support to, to start tackling groundwater. Um, just wanted to, to, to add that to your presentation. Yeah, um, we have already two hands up. Um, so yes, um, we have Dr. Ahmed, I cannot see the Gali Muhammad. Uh, you would like to say something? Make sure you unmute yourself. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Arnold, for coordination. Thank you, Christina. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good, good. <clears throat> you did a very, very good uh, presentation on this transboundary uh, aquifer management. And you raise a question here. Actions on one side of the border can have impact for the other side in transboundary management. What are the if what are the possibility of correlation of these impacts in respect to the aquifer? And is there any specific aquifer that if an action is taken in country A, it will affect action in country B? And in what way? That is the first question. The second question is there are about 12 transboundary aquifer in Nile rivers. If the transboundary aquifer in Nile rivers are up to 12, that means they have elements of water reserves in the aquifer. What is the crisis on the Ethiopian dam for their energy and economic growth? If yeah. Egypt can go and extract water for their economy in this 12 TBA, 
why should there be crazy tension on love of relief in inter international scene? Have they not been guided or what is happening? These are two questions I need your light on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's for, for you, Christina. Yeah, well, to, to maybe start with the first one, um, in terms of impacts on transboundary aquifers um, and trying to quantify that is quite difficult because the issue is that every transboundary aquifer is different. There's going to be a range of hydrogeological parameters, you know, things like the transmissivity and storage within an aquifer, all of those considerations are going to influence how something impacts on the other side. And, you know, there might be times where sustainable levels of pumping on one side of the border won't impact the other side of the border. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the main message I think here is that in many cases, we don't actually know what the impact might be. And that's why it's important to conduct these assessments in order to really understand the aquifer so that we can then know what potential actions on one side of the border can have for our neighbours. Um, in terms of the question on the on the Nile Basin, it's, it's not really a specific area of expertise for me, um, specifically related to the dam. I don't know if we have anyone um, in attendance in the audience who who might be able to to answer that question. Um, Arnold, do you have anything to on that? No, I, I, I don't have any particular insight on, on, on this region, but I think indeed uh, what is at stake is really um, the how to share water in, in, in the region yeah. so that every country yeah. has access to water, but whether it's water, surface water, groundwater, in the end shouldn't matter. What yeah. matters is that all the countries have sufficient water of good quality. So indeed, when we're discussing the, the sharing of water in the region, we should, of course, look at surface water, but also groundwater. This is part of the, of the, um, uh, of, of the, not the problem, maybe it's more part of the solution, maybe. Um, but we need to look at, indeed, surface water and groundwater. Uh, and I think that's why the, the, the Nile uh, Basin Initiative is, uh, is carrying on uh, projects on, on transboundary aquifers uh, in, in the region. Neno, you want to react on that? Yeah, just uh, shortly. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Athens, for, for your question. And uh, it's good that you mentioned uh, Nile because Nile is uh, an excellent example uh, of complexity of the problem. Uh, it is important for so many countries in the region and you have a surface water which is visible. Uh, where people see uh, what neighbors are, are doing and can react immediately. And, and still there's a lot of uh, effort and patience uh, required to, to make steps uh, forward. And then groundwater, which is invisible, uh, needs uh, much more attention, especially in assessing uh, what the situation is. So that's the reason we are uh, so uh, keen in, in promoting uh, 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 regular monitoring and uh, assessment in the River Basin uh, organization. Thank you. Someone else wanted to react to, the, to your question, uh, Dr. Hamed. Uh, Henry, uh, Ingbe Yulia? We'll let you react and then we can move to uh, another question from Olu uh, Wesayun Olabode. Henry, do you want to, to react to answer to the question? Hello. Hello, good morning. Uh, good morning. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, what I was saying uh, concerning um, Dr. Ahmed's question on transboundary aquifers, will it have any impact if they, they, they don't have any adequate monitoring team? Because, like you said, Egypt is trying to like maybe harmonize the uh, lesser uh, resources for their country. So will it cause any problem that maybe leads to pollution or whatever? 
that's my question. My suggestion, sorry. Sorry, I, I didn't get it. Um, Christina? Uh, sorry, I think it was a bit broken up. Um, yeah, there, there was some background noise, so I, I, I didn't completely understand your question. Can you can you repeat, please? I didn't. I did not get uh, Henry response clearly. Henry, would you be able to repeat your question? I think there was a bit of interference um, while you were speaking. Or... You're, you're muted. Okay, well, I suggest we move to, to another question because we have other participants who raised their hands. Uh, Olu Soon, uh, Ola Bode, uh, would you like yeah. to, to say uh, something? Yeah, uh, good morning. Um, I'm Olu Aishin, Ola Bode from University of Baden, Scotland, UK. I want to thank you for the, today's event. I've learned a lot. But my question is that we have listed a lot of uh, transparent archivists in Africa, and that's fine. Can we have an idea of the states of work that have been done so far on those aquifers? Like me now, like want to pick up an aquifer to work, not if there are funds or if there are no funds to look at what some of us can do or to volunteer to work on those stuff. Can we have a list of those TBAs that have worked on? Can we have uh, some of them that are in urgent state for research to be carried out? Can we have some gaps on all of those TBAs so that some of us can pick on needs, and if some of, and if some um, basic organization also need assistance, can they also show up so that we can also see? Because it's one thing to raise a challenge; it's another thing to also see people who can volunteer or people who can also step in to work. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, well, it's difficult to to answer that. Uh... Right now, I mean, uh, we should look at uh, TBA one one by one. Um, probably in the um, in one of the references that uh, Christina shared, uh, the one from 2018 from here to Nesten and, and and colleagues, um, they made an overview of the status of knowledge and, and assessment of of TBAs in Africa. So that's um, probably you you could find the answer to your question there. But um, in general, uh, there are things going on. I would say um, in the in the Sadiq region, uh, in in Eastern uh, Africa, in Northern Africa, Western Africa, Central Africa, uh, I think groundwater is less uh, is less a concern for them because uh, there's more water available in, in general. But in the other regions I mentioned, there is uh, it, it already an attention on on groundwater and and activities going on uh, for. Uh, and an increasing uh, attention on, on TBAs. Um, what we've noticed over the last years um, is that uh, a lot has been done um, via uh, the Groundwater Management Institute in, in the Sadiq region. Uh, they have a, a regional institution in charge of, uh, of, uh, of groundwater, supporting the countries and river basin organizations. Uh, to um, to assess groundwater, to manage groundwater, and uh, the, the center was uh, had a, a good funding, and and they were able to uh, to, uh, to to um, to implement some uh, some projects on uh, on transboundary aquifers in in the Sadiq region. Um, but you will find more information in that in that reference. Uh, maybe yeah, I just I just you can share it in the chat. Yeah, uh, I just shared it, so one step ahead of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> By a um, great starting point. Um, a question from Walter or Latunji? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you well. No? Okay. Yes. Please. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the uh, for this wonderful training and. Uh, uh, I, I actually uh, thank the first and the second uh, presenters. My question is on the aspect of the irrigation return water. 
irrigation return water and poor irrigation practices. We have seen that a uh, majority of uh, uh, pollution uh, from uh, agri uh, activities are from maybe irrigation, which can be traced to the fertilizers and which find their way into this groundwater. And uh, so my concern is how can we have a, a, a kind of a regulation in, in, in the aspect of uh, chemicals that are being used for fertilizers or can we just go for organic fertilizer? Or if not, can we have a, a, a very good uh, understanding on uh, how we can properly have these farmers to have best uh, affordable practices in their irrigation activities so that they can know that the, the, the impact they are making on, on, the, on the farmland is affecting the groundwater and subsequently affecting the surface water. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for your question. I think it's a question for, for Seifu. Yes, should I answer now? Please, yes. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if I have uh, an answer uh, for that, a specific answer for that. Nevertheless, uh, the very important matter here is irrigation practices affect water quality of the surface water flows. That is the obvious part. And that is obvious and that most policy makers and decision takers take. But what this lecture was about is that irrigation practices can also impact the groundwater. Call it salinity, call it emerging contaminants, pesticides, herbicides, or, or call it any other contaminant that comes from agricultural sources. And once the groundwater is contaminated, it is very difficult to, uh, to restore it, to restore to, to initial conditions. So through demonstrating the connection between the connection between uh, surface waters and uh, groundwater, uh, the water quality is also connected. Okay, so that is uh, the most important part. But uh, regards to what can be done. Yeah, what can be done to, to reduce the impact. Yeah, it all depends on agricultural pr practices, uh, on, for instance, for salinization problems. Uh, there are uh, farming techniques, irrigation, uh, irrigation techniques that would limit the salinization problems, that would curb the salinization problems. And also in terms of fertilizers, fertilizer applications, there are certain guidelines uh, that matches the irrigation practice. And then uh, uh, I think among the agriculture communities, uh, I think there is a good answer uh, for, for that question. But the point here is the two systems are connected. If you pollute one, you pollute the other. Okay, so yeah. Back to you, Arno. Dr. Seifu, sorry, permit me, please. Yes, please go uh, ahead. Dr. Sebu, please permit me. Uh, this is your area of expertise. The question raised by the brother is very pertinent in respect to uh, irrigation farming methodologies in Africa. He asked you, based on your experience, are you suggesting that organic fertilizer should be more less harmful than the chemical fertilizer. What are, you, what are you prescribing to in order to maintain the groundwater quality level in Africa? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is a really tough, uh, tough question. Uh, I, I cannot prescribe. I cannot pres prescribe that uh, organic fertilizer is good and the other one is, is bad uh, because uh, countries have different uh, policies, different aspirations. Some countries want to become full uh, sufficient and would want to apply fertilizers. Uh, others uh, would want to uh, environmental water quality maybe of their interest. So it depends on where you are. 
and it depends on the policies and the development pathways uh, the countries uh, would want to follow. And uh, it, it is difficult for me to prescribe and choose one over the other. But uh, uh, what, what I can say is uh, it depends on the national interests, but if countries would for, want to follow the pathway of uh, fertilizer or, uh, utilization and uh, agricultural mechanization, et cetera, there are better ways of doing it. So by doing it in a better way, farming practices, uh, proper fertilizer applications, maybe the environmental costs can be curbed. But uh, uh, I cannot prescribe as, uh, you, you know, I cannot prescribe one is uh, better and the other is not. Uh, so it, it depends on the choices of the countries. But uh, our role is to demonstrate what the challenges and how to overcome these challenges. Thank you, Seifu. Uh, there is a question from Keinde Afolabi. Please unmute yourself and uh... Keinde Afolabi. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, well. Okay, very good. Good, good morning. Oh, it was almost if I'm a, I'm speaking from Nigeria. My it's not a question per se. It's a comment regarding the request by the man from uh, Scotland, one Mr. Olabodi. He was requesting for where to get information about groundwater studies, and I think we have a lot of uh, places where you can get them in Nigeria. One. He can go to Federal Ministry of Water Resources in Abuja, in Nigeria, and at, because they will have some studies on the illuminating basins in Africa. Secondly, I think there are studies around the uh, Niger Benue basin on groundwater. So he could collaborate with the ministry in this regard. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was muted, but uh, th thank you for uh, your, uh, your intervention. Um, there is a raise hand, uh, Awadala Arbab. Good morning, and thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, actually, my question is uh, regarding the water quality and policy towards the water quality. As the presenter mentioned that the, the water quality affects many people, healthfully. My question I witnessed in many areas, people suffering from the water quality, as he said, they have fluoride in the water, high concentration of sodium. So, we found whole region, all villages are has the same problem for the centuries. Is there any policy, meteor policy, on the move these people or to solve this uh, problem? Because to treat the water is very difficult for and it's costly. So if there is any solution that move them in some place, if there is any studies on this way, thank you. Yeah, uh, can I answer that question or no? Yes. Sure. Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, when you look into water policies of uh, many countries, there is a more emphasis to the water quantity aspect, uh, water allocation, irrigation and drainage, uh, and uh, resource development. But the water quality aspect is generally very thin, regardless of uh, the increasing evidence that the impacts of water quality on economies, on health, et cetera, 
is significant. So some countries, you, you don't see at policy level clear, you know, thing and uh, wanting to do this, 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 and that. These technological measures are taken, technological measure, etc. But there are practices, patches of practices by different countries. Like in Tunisia, for instance, uh, managed aquifer recharge to intentionally to keep salinity levels low and uh, wastewater uh, discharge into coastal environments to keep uh, saline water intrusion uh, at low, in, like in South Africa. And uh, in some countries, relaxation of the WHO guidelines, uh, although this is, uh, it, it has its own problems, but uh, generally speaking, the water quality aspect is largely missing in uh, many water uh, policies uh, across Africa, and there is a need uh, for, for its integration into, into the policies. And practice-wise, uh, yes, there are practices like uh, desalination, for instance, uh, which is increasingly being introduced because of uh, also becoming cheaper uh, technology. And uh, other countries use biosaline agriculture in MENA region, in Arab regions. Uh, others are uh, using blending. Uh, so there are many technical measures that can be taken and uh, this needs to be uh, encouraged. For instance, uh, Djibouti. In Djibouti, if you drill a borehole and that borehole turns to be saline, a contractor is obliged to drill another borehole until that person or that company finds uh, fresh water. So different countries follow different approaches and then uh, we need a, a kind of compilation and then uh, integration into the national policies. Thank you. Thank you, Sefou. Uh, Mustafa and Moshut wanted to react at, uh, I think on this, uh, on this topic. Uh, Mustafa, you say you have an example from Senegal. Merci, uh, Arnaud. Thank you, Arnaud. In Senegal, we have an issue with a natural contamination of aquifers with a high rate of uh, fluoride and salt. It's impacting a large part of uh, the territory and it's affecting about a million people. So you have a lot of salt and fluoride. So what was initiated in recent years is some desanalization uh, techniques in a number of uh, villages for human consumption. Although later on, it was shown that the water that uh, desanalyzed came back to uh, levels that are not uh, good for consumption. And it was a problem. But more and more, what is happening in uh, this area where the water became uh, contaminated with fluoride and uh, salt, we are doing now research on areas where water is good quality and now we introduce uh, transfer programs uh, from, uh, uh, of water from those areas. I believe in future, the policy of the Ministry of Water will be to help those areas where the quality is poor so that they could benefit from good quality water from other areas. And also when it comes to the SDGs, we can see that they put more emphasis on quality. Uh, you know, before quality was not so much considered. It was not the main uh, concern. But now with the, oh, the SDG, we can see there is a concerted effort to transport to transfer water from good quality areas to poor quality areas. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Mustafa. On va donner la parole à, à Moshoud qui voulait réagir, je pense. Sur... We'll, uh, hand over to Moshoud as well, who wants to say something. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think uh, I have to commend uh, Sefu for the for nice presentation and responses to some of those questions. I'm happy that there are a lot of questions and interests about the water quality issue. But what I just want to say about it is that I think we need to take the issue of water quality serious. It's, it's a silent danger that we are overlooking. Many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are not, I mean, there are challenges in terms of the, even the technical ability and the instrumental facilities, apart from the technical, I mean, the instrumental facilities for analysis and monitoring the quality is lacking. And the decision makers are not taking this as I mean, serious. And looking at the trend of the water demand, groundwater is becoming obviously the, the beautiful bride now even in urban area where Iteto pipe bond water supplies are there. There are proliferation of boreholes here everywhere because the public systems are failing. And more increase in the use of groundwater without cognizance of the quality impact in a system where there is no central sewage system. A lot of in-house septic tank So there are serious challenges when it comes to water quality problem in sub-Saharan Africa. And it is high time that the decision maker, the professionals who are in the position to advise decision maker to try to take this as a serious uh, uh, thing to look at for the future. Because otherwise it will get to a point that The only source of water that is taking care of more than 70% of the people in rural area will become so useless to use that, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a very big concern. I just feel that most of us in this forum today realize this and will do our bit in making sure that we make noise and let the decision maker know the, the imminent dangers in not protecting and monitoring groundwater quality. I think there is a lot that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Moshut. Um, is, does anybody want to, to react on that and to ask, uh, I think there is time for one or two last questions. No? And I think we can close. Uh, we can close here. Um, well, I want to thank. Dr. Nelo should act on it, uh, Arnold. Oh, okay. Let us hear the opinion of Dr. Nelo. Nelo, yes. you want to say something? Uh, well, you know, as as a uh, as uh, Dave Kramer uh, would say, President of IH. Don't miss a, a good opportunity to shut up and not talk too much. And I'm really trying uh, not to intervene here because I'm listening to uh, excellent uh, presentations and, and very, very relevant uh, questions. And uh, look, uh, uh, we are all African in our heart, and that's the reason that we are here. And we are very much concerned about. Uh, Uh, future water resources in Africa, and uh, especially uh, talking about uh, groundwater pollution, about uh, salinization. Uh, I, I uh, send a link around. We started, uh, and, and Seifu is, is there as well, uh, initiative on, on groundwater quality globally, and we are going to focus on, on Africa. I'm going to talk uh, day after tomorrow a little bit about next year, year of groundwater and all kind of initiatives we would like to, to take to address uh, groundwater uh, more uh, thoroughly in, in the coming years, but um, that will be on, on, on Wednesday. So um, uh, thank you. And back to Arno, I think we should close the day. Thank you.
Oui, merci Neno. On va, on va s'arrêter ici, en effet. Euh, je voudrais remercier. Merci euh... Neno. Please allow me to thank all the participants for being so many and uh, for being attentive to the presentations. I also want to thank uh, the presenters for the great presentations. I hope will be uh, more participants tomorrow. So thank you uh, for participating and have a great day further. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much, Arnold. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nano, for a wonderful package. Alice, Luciana, thank you. Arnold. Merci. So, thank you, the wonderful package. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, all. Christiana, please.